Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Black, will open the Senate with prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, have compassion on us with your unfailing love. As our lawmakers prepare to formally certify the votes cast by the Electoral College, be present with them. Guide our legislators with your wisdom and truth as they seek to meet the requirements of the United States Constitution. Lord, inspire them to seize this opportunity to demonstrate to the nation and world how the democratic process can be done properly and in an orderly manner. Help them to remember that history is a faithful stenographer, and so are you. We pray in your sovereign name. Amen. <clears throat> Will you please join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will be in a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each. The chair lays before the Senate the communication of the Secretary of the Senate regarding a message from the President received during the adjournment of the Senate. Dear Mr. President, on Tuesday, January 5, 2021, the President of the United States sent by messenger the attached sealed envelope addressed to the President of the Senate dated January 5, 2021, said to contain a message regarding additional steps addressing the threat posed by applications and other software developed or controlled by Chinese companies. The Senate not being in session on the day which the President delivered the message, I accepted the message on, at 5 p.m. and I now present to you the President's message with the accompanying papers for disposition by the Senate. Respectfully, Julie A. Adams, Secretary of the Senate. Mr. President. Senator from Iowa. I understand that there is a bill at the desk that is due for a second reading. Clerk will read the title of the bill for the second time. S11, a bill to provide for an exception to a limitation against appointments of persons as Secretary of Defense within seven years of relief from active duty as a regular commissioned officer of the armed forces. In order to place, Mr. President, in order to place the bill on the counter under the provisions of Rule 14, I would object to further reading. Objection having been heard, the bill be placed in the calendar. Uh, also, Mr. President, I understand that there's a bill at the desk and I ask for its first reading. Clerk will read the title of the bill for the first time. S13, a bill to establish an advisory committee to make recommendations on improvements to the security, integrity, and administration of federal elections. Mr. President, I now ask for a second reading, and in order to place the bill on the counter under the provisions of Rule 14, I object to my own request. Objection having been heard, the bill will receive its second reading on the next legislative day.
Under the provisions of SCON Res 1, the Senate will now proceed as a body to the Hall of the House of Representatives for the counting of the electoral ballots. Good, how are you? Good, good. Everything good with your position and the people in front of you? Yes, we've um, used this four times so far. Oh, wow, well, okay. Yeah. Good. All right, so you're, you're not concerned about people no, we're collecting? Good, yeah. Okay, you're high enough? Yeah. Perfect. Cool, okay. Thank you. You got it. Hey, how are you? Good. I think this will be a very different kind of work. Yeah. We won't have pages from the electoral ballot boxes. Uh, we won't have as many senators. There's actually uh, you know, who the heck knows how to do it. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, but it is kind of a, it's a, it's a cool perspective. Uh, right? This is the final delivery of right. the electoral right. ballot so to the chamber. Uh, so they do it for all joint meetings and joint sessions. Okay. Yeah. When do those usually happen? So a joint session, uh, you know, typically. Um, so a, a, a state of union is a joint session. Uh, so basically, do you know the difference between a joint session? Okay. So it's really the same thing. Uh, the president will accept the presidential debate of the
Speaker, the Vice President, and the United States Senate.
as the House comes to order for this important historic meeting, let us remind that each side, House and Senate, Democrats and Republicans, each have 11 members allowed to be present on the floor. Others may be in the gallery. This is at the guidance of the uh, officiating uh, attending physician and the sergeants at arm. The gentleman on the Republican side of the aisle will please observe the social distancing and, and agree to what we have 11 members on each side so that we can responsibilities to this chamber, to this responsibility, and to this House of Representatives. Please exit the floor if you do not have an assigned role from your leadership. You can share with your staff if you want to have a few more, but you cannot be that close together on the floor of the House with that many people in here. And I thank the Senate and the Democrats for sitting by the rules. Let's go. Let's just start. Okay. Madam Speaker and members of Congress, pursuant to the Constitution and the laws of the United States, the Senate and House of Representatives are meeting in joint session to verify the certificates and count the votes of the electors of the several states for President and Vice President of the United States. After ascertainment has been had that the certificates are authentic and correct in form, the tellers will count and make a list of the votes cast by the electors of the several states. The tellers on the part of the two houses have taken their places at the clerk's desk. Without objection, the tellers will dispense with the reading of the formal portions of the certificates. After ascertaining that the certificates are regular in form and authentic, the tellers will announce the votes cast by the electors for each state, beginning with Alabama, which the parliamentarians advise me is the only certificate of vote from that state and purports to be a return from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. Blunt. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Point of order, parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Vice President. In order to follow with the speaker's instructions that only a limited number of people be on the floor, May I ask how one would make an objection or make a parliamentary inquiry in the future if you're not on the floor but in the gallery? Under Section 18 of Title III of the United States Code, uh, debate is not permitted in the joint session. Gentlemen's recognized. I'm not attempting to debate. I'm trying to find out how a parliamentary inquiry or a parliamentary point of order would be made in following with the speaker's uh, request that most of us not be on the floor. How do you make one of those points of order when you don't know what's going to happen later? Uh, respectfully, the gentleman's parliamentary inquiry constitutes debate, which is not permitted in the joint session under Section 18 of Title III, United States Code. For that, Mr. Blunt. I don't think it's on. I believe it's on.
Mr. President, order in the chamber. Mr. President, the gentleman will continue. The certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Alabama seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received nine votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received nine votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Alabama that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. This certificate from Alaska, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Alaska seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received three votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received three votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Alaska that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Arizona, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote that the state purports to be a return from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Arizona seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received 11 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 11 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Arizona that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? President, I, Paul Gosar from Arizona. For what Sport. purpose does the gentleman from Arizona rise? I rise up for myself and 60 of my colleagues to object to the uh, counting of the electoral ballots from Arizona. Uh, is the objection in writing and signed by a senator? Yes, it is. An objection presented in writing and signed by both a representative and a senator complies with the law, Chapter 1 of Title III of the United States Code. The clerk will report the objection. Objection to counting the electoral votes of the state of Arizona. We, a member of the House of Representatives and a United States Senator, object to the counting of the electoral votes of the state of Arizona on the ground that they were not, under all of the known circumstances, regularly given. Are there further objections to the certificates from the state of Arizona? The chair hears none. The two houses will withdraw from joint session. Each house will deliberate separately on the pending objection and report its decision back to the joint session. The Senate will now retire to its chamber.
can Joe and I hop off? Okay. We'll, we'll be tight. We'll hang tight. I mean, we'll, we'll be close by. We will not be in the room. Okay.
but for those states that this wasn't followed. Unfortunately, this is not new. We've seen over and over again more states where the Democrat Party has gone in and selectively gone around this process. That has to end, Madam Speaker. We have to follow the constitutional process. Now, there might be reasons why some people don't like the process laid out by a legislative body. Madam Speaker, I served on one of those legislative bodies when I was in the state legislature for 12 years. I served on the House and Governmental Affairs Committee where we wrote the laws for our state's elections. And I can tell you, when we had to make changes, those were extensively negotiated. We would have people on both sides come, Republicans and Democrats, Madam Speaker, would get together to work through those changes, any minute change, to how a precinct would function, to how a change would be made in the time of an election, signature requirements, all the many things that involve a clerk carrying out the duties in each parish, in our case. You would see people come and give testimony. Madam Speaker, both sides could come. Clerks of court were there in the hearing rooms. It was an open process, by the way not behind closed doors in a smoke-filled room where somebody might want to bully a Secretary of State to get a different version that might benefit them or their party or their candidate. That's not what our founding fathers said is the process. Maybe it's how some people wanted to carry it out, but they laid out that process. And so when we would have to make those changes, they were in public view. They were heavily debated. And then ultimately, those laws were changed in advance of the election so everybody knew what the rules were. People on both sides knew how to play the rules before the game started, not getting somewhere in the process and saying, well, you don't think it's going to benefit you, so you try to go around the Constitution. That's not how our system works. It's gotten out of hand. And so President Trump has called this out. And President Trump has stood up to it, so many of us, have stood up to it. And in fact, over a hundred of my colleagues, Madam Speaker, asked the Supreme Court to address this problem just a few weeks ago. And unfortunately, the court chose to punt. They didn't answer it one way or the other. They didn't want to get in the middle of this discussion. We don't have that luxury today. We have to discuss this. We have to fix this. In fact, on our first full day of this Congress, Many of us brought legislation onto the House floor to start fixing the problems with our elections, to restore integrity to the election process, which has been lost by so many millions of Americans. And we had a vote. Every single Republican voted to reform the process. Every single Democrat voted against it. They don't want to fix this problem. But the Constitution is our guide. And it's time we start following the Constitution. It's time we get back to what our founding fathers said is the process for selecting electors. That's the legislatures. In public view, not behind closed doors, not smoke-filled rooms, not bullying somebody that might give you a better ruling. Let's get back to rule of law and follow the Constitution, Madam Speaker. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlewoman For what purpose does the gentlewoman from California seek recognition? To strike the last word. Without objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for Madam five Speaker, minutes. Madam Speaker, this day marks a crossroads for American democracy. Those who object to the counting of the Electoral College votes, which reflect the votes of the American people, wants to want to substitute their preferences for the voters' choice. That's not what our Constitution requires, and it's at odds with American Democratic Republic. 
If Congress selects the next president instead of American voters, we'll have no need for an electoral college. In fact, we'd have no need for presidential elections at all. We'd be moving from a government elected by the people to a government selected by those already governing. That's not America. In the United States, we abide by the choices of the people, not an elite few. The framers of our Constitution considered whether to have Congress select a president and specifically rejected it. Instead, they wrote Article II and the 12th Amendment. <clears throat> Article II creates the Electoral College, where each state appoints electors. Laws of all 50 states in D.C. require electors to vote for the winner of the state's popular election. Each state provides for the orderly conduct of elections, including lawful challenges, recounts, and the like. The 12th Amendment is what brings us to today. It says the electors meet in their states. That happened December 14th. The amendment says the electors shall cast their votes, sign and certify them, transmit them to a seal. That's been done. The sealed envelopes containing the signed, certified ballots from each state's electors, reflecting the votes of the people, were in those mahogany boxes. The 12th Amendment directs the president, as the uh, vice president, as the president of the Senate, to do only this. Open the sealed envelopes, and then the votes shall be counted. Six. After which the chair will put the question, shall the objection be sustained? The clerk will report the objection made in the joint session. Objection from Representative Gozar from Arizona and Senator Cruz and others. We, a member of the House of Representatives and a United States Senator, object to the counting of the electoral votes of the state of Arizona on the grounds that they were not, under all of the known circumstances, regularly given. Majority Leader. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the Majority Leader and the Democratic Leader be allowed to speak and that following their remarks, the Majority Leader and the Democratic Leader each control up to one hour of debate, debate time and be authorized to yield up to five minutes of that time to any senator seeking recognition. Further, I ask unanimous consent that the senators be permitted to insert statements into the record. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President. Majority Leader. We're debating a step that has never been taken in American history. Whether Congress should overrule the voters and overturn a presidential election. I've served 36 years in the Senate this will be the most important vote I've ever cast. President Trump claims the election was stolen. The assertions range from specific local allegations to constitutional arguments to sweeping conspiracy theories. I supported the president's right to use the legal system Dozens of lawsuits received hearings in courtrooms all across our country. But over and over, the courts rejected these claims, including all-star judges whom the president himself has nominated. Every election, we know, features some illegality and irregularity, and of course, that's unacceptable. I support strong state-led voting reforms. Last year's bizarre pandemic procedures must not become the new norm. But my colleagues, nothing before us proves illegality anywhere near the massive scale the massive scale that would have tipped the entire election. Nor can public doubt alone justify a radical break when the doubt itself was incited without any evidence. The 
Constitution gives us here in Congress a limited role. We cannot simply declare ourselves a national board of elections on steroids. The voters, the courts, and the states have all spoken. They've all spoken. If we overrule them, it would damage our republic forever. This election actually was not unusually close. Just in recent history, 1976, 2000, and 2004 were all closer than this one. The electoral card the college uh, margin is almost identical to what it was in 2016. If this election were overturned by mere allegations from the losing side, our democracy would enter a death spiral. We'd never see the whole nation accept an election again. Every four years would be a scramble for power at any cost. The Electoral College, which most of us on this side have been defending for years, would cease to exist, leaving many of our states with no real say at all in choosing a president. The effects would go even beyond the elections themselves. Self-government, my colleagues, requires a shared commitment to the truth and a shared respect for the ground rules of our system. We cannot keep drifting apart into two separate tribes with a separate set of facts and separate realities. With nothing in common except our hostility towards each other and mistrust for the few national institutions that we all still share. Every time, every time, in the last 30 years that Democrats have lost a presidential race, they've tried a challenge just like this after 2000, after 2004, after 2016. After 2004, a senator joined and forced the same debate. And believe it or not, Democrats like Harry Reid, Dick Durbin, and Hillary Clinton praised, praised them and applauded the stunt. Republicans condemned those baseless efforts back then that we just spent four years condemning Democrats' shameful attacks on the validity of President Trump's own election. So look, there can be no double standard. The media that is outraged today spent four years aiding and abetting Democrats' attacks on our institutions after they lost. But we must not imitate and escalate what we repudiate. Our duty is to govern for the public good. The United States Senate has a higher calling than an endless spiral of partisan vengeance. Congress will either override the voters, overrule them, the voters, the states, and the courts for the first time ever, or honor the people's decision. We'll either guarantee Democrats' delegitimizing efforts after 2016 become a permanent new routine for both sides, or declare that our nation deserves a lot better than this. We'll either hasten 
down a poisonous path where only the winners of election actually accept the results, or show we can still muster the patriotic courage that our forebearers showed, not only in victory, but in defeat. The framers built the Senate to stop short-term passions from boiling over and melting the foundations of our republic. So I believe protecting our constitutional order requires respecting the limits of our own power. It would be unfair and wrong to disenfranchise American voters and overrule the courts and the states on this extraordinarily thin basis. And I will not pretend such a vote would be a harmless protest gesture while relying on others to do the right thing. I will vote to respect the people's decision and defend our system of government as we know it. Mr. Leader. Mr. President, Vice President, as prescribed by the Constitution and the laws of the nation, the purpose of this joint session is for tellers, appointed on a bipartisan basis by the two houses, to read to the Congress the results of an election that has already happened. We are here to receive an announcement of a vote that has already been certified by every state in the Union and confirmed by the courts many times, many times over. We're here to watch the current vice president open envelopes and receive the news of a verdict that has already been rendered. It is a solemn and august occasion, no doubt, but it is a formality. The Congress does not determine the outcome of elections, the people do. The Congress is not endowed with the power to administer elections. Our states are given that power. By the end of the proceedings today, it will be confirmed once again something that is well known and well settled. The American people elected Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to be the next president and vice president of the United States. And yet, a number of our colleagues have organized an effort to undermine and object to that free and fair election. They're in the minority. They will lose. They know that. They have no evidence of widespread voter fraud upon which to base their objections. That's because there is none. There is none. Not brought before any of the courts successfully. They know that President Trump and his allies have suffered the defeat, a defeat in, co in court after court across the country, losing no fewer than 62 legal challenges. And I might add many Republican appointed judges, some appointed by President Trump, rendered those decisions. They know, you all know, that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are going to be sworn in as President and Vice President of the United States on January 20th. But they are going to object to the counting of the vote anyway. And in the process, they will embarrass themselves, they will embarrass their party, and worst of all, they will embarrass their country. This insurrection was fortunately discouraged by the leadership of the majority party, but it was not quelled. It is a very sad comment on our times that merely the accepting the results of an election is considered an act of political courage. Sadder and more dangerous still is the fact that an element of the Republican Party 
believes their political viability hinges on the endorsement of an attempted coup. That anyone, much less an elected official, would be willing to tarnish our democracy in order to burnish their personal political fortunes. Over the course of the afternoon, and however far into the evening this band of Republican objectors wants to take us, senators of goodwill from both sides of the aisle will explain why these challenges must be dismissed. The senators from states whose electoral votes are being challenged will explain how the allegations of fraud are baseless. And a substantial bipartisan majority must vote to put down these objections and defend the sanctity of our elections and indeed, and indeed, our great and grand democracy. Because that's what we're talking about today. The health of our democracy. This wonderful, beautiful, grand democracy where the peaceful passing of the torch is extolled by school children in the second grade, but not by some here. As we speak, half of our voters are being conditioned by the outgoing president to believe that when his party loses an election, the results must not be legitimate. As we speak, the eyes of the world are on this chamber, questioning whether America is still the shining example of democracy, the shining city on the hill. What message we send today? What message will we send today to our people, to the world that has so looked up to us for centuries? What message will we send to fledgling democracies who study our Constitution, mirror our laws and traditions in the hopes that they too can build a country ruled by the consent of the governed? What message will we send to those countries where democratic values are under assault and look to us to see if those values are still worth fighting for. What message will we send to every dark corner of the world where human rights are betrayed, elections are stolen, human dignity denied? What will we show those people? Will we show those people that there is a better way to ensure liberty and opportunity of humankind. Sadly, a small band of Republican objectors may darken the view of our democracy today. But a larger group of senators and House members from both sides of the aisle can send a message too. The democ that democracy beats deep in the hearts of our citizens and our elected representatives that we are a country of laws and of not men, that our traditions are not so easily discarded, even by our president, that facts matter, that truth matters, that while democracy allows free speech and free expression, even if that expression is anti-democratic, there will always, always be, praise God, a far broader and stronger coalition ready to push back and defend everything we hold dear. We can send that message today by voting in large and overwhelming numbers to defeat these objections. My colleagues, we each swore an oath just three days ago that we would defend and support the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that we would bear true faith and allegiance to the same. We swore that we took this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that we could well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office we were about to enter, so help us God. The precise words of that oath were shortly written after the Civil War, 
when the idea of true faith and allegiance to this country and its constitution took on enormous meaning. Let those words, let those words ring in the ears of every senator today. Let us do our duty to support, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help us God. Majority Leader. I yield up to five minutes to the Senator from Texas, Senator Cruz. Mr. President. Senator. We gathered together at a moment of great division, at a moment of great passion. We have seen, and no doubt will continue to see, a great deal of moralizing from both sides of the aisle. But I would urge to both sides perhaps a bit less certitude and a bit more recognition that we are gathered at a time when democracy is in crisis. Recent polling shows that 39% of Americans believe the election that just occurred, quote, was rigged. You may not agree with that assessment, but it is nonetheless a reality for nearly half the country. I would note it is not just Republicans who believe that. 31% of independents agree with that statement. 17% of Democrats believe the election was rigged. Even if you do not share that conviction, it is the responsibility, I believe, of this office to acknowledge that is a profound threat to this country and to the legitimacy of any administrations that will come in the future. I want to take a moment to speak to my Democratic colleagues. I understand your guy is winning right now. If Democrats vote as a block, Joe Biden will almost certainly be certified as the next president of the United States. I want to speak to the Republicans who are considering voting against these objections. I understand your concerns, but I urge you to pause and think what does it say to the nearly half the country that believes this election was rigged if we vote not even to consider the claims of illegality and fraud in this election? And I believe there's a better way. The leaders just spoke about setting aside the election. Let me be clear, I am not arguing for setting aside the result of this election. All of us are faced with two choices, both of which are lousy. One choice is vote against the objection. And tens of millions of Americans will see a vote against the objection as a statement that voter fraud doesn't matter, isn't real, and shouldn't be taken seriously. And a great many of us don't believe that. On the other hand, most if not all of us believe we should not set aside the results of an election just because our candidate may not have prevailed. And so I endeavored to look for door number three, a third option, and for that I looked to history, to the precedent of the 1876 election, the Hayes-Tilden election, where this Congress appointed an electoral commission to examine claims of voter fraud. Five House members, five senators, five Supreme Court justices examined the evidence and rendered a judgment. And what I would urge of this body is that we do the same that we appoint an electoral commission to conduct a 10-day emergency audit, consider the evidence, and resolve the claims. For those on the Democratic aisle who says, say there is no evidence, they've been rejected, then you should rest in comfort. If that's the case, an electoral commission would reject those claims. But for those who respect the voters, simply telling the voters, go jump in a lake, the fact that you have deep concerns is of no moment to us, that jeopardizes, I believe, the legitimacy of this and subsequent elections. The Constitution gives to Congress the responsibility this day to count the votes. The framers knew what they were doing when they gave responsibilities to, to Congress. We have a responsibility 
and I would urge that we follow the precedent of 1877. The Electoral Count Act explicitly allows objections such as this one for votes that were not regularly given. And let me be clear, this objection is for the state of Arizona, but it is broader than that. It is an objection for all six of the contested states to have a credible, objective, impartial body hear the evidence and make a conclusive determination. That would benefit both sides. That would improve legitimacy of this election. And so let me urge my colleagues, all of us take our responsibility seriously. I would urge my colleagues don't take perhaps the easy path, but instead act together, astonish the viewers and act in a bipartisan sense to say we will have a credible and fair tribunal, consider the claims, consider the facts, consider the evidence, and make a conclusive determination whether and to what extent this election complied with the Constitution and with federal law. Senator from Minnesota. Mr. President, I first would like to say I appreciate uh, the words of our leader, Senator Schumer, as well as Senator McConnell's call for a higher calling. January 6th is not typically a day of historical significance for our country. For centuries, this day is simply the day that we receive each state's th certified electoral votes, and it has come and gone without much fanfare. In fact, this is only the third time in 120 years that the Senate has gathered to debate an objection, and as Senator Cruz well knows, both times these objections were resoundingly defeated. The last time the vote was 74 to 1. Why? Because senators have long believed that they should not mess around with the will of the people. They have understood the words of our great former colleague John McCain from the state of Arizona, who once said that nothing in life is more liberating than to fight for a cause larger than yourself. In this case, my colleagues, our cause, despite our political differences, is to preserve our American democracy, to preserve our republic, because as someone once said long ago, it's a republic if you can keep it. Now, I appreciate all my Democratic and Republican colleagues who have joined our ranks of coup fighters, who have stood up for our democracy, who stand tall for our republic, and who believe in an ideal greater than ourselves, larger than our political parties. That ideal is America. And Senator Cruz, he knows this. On January 20th, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be sworn in as president and vice president of the United States. He knows that President-elect Biden won more votes than any president in history and more than seven million more votes than President Trump. Despite the unfounded conspiracy theories Senator Cruz touts, he knows that high-ranking officials in President Trump's own Homeland Security Department have concluded that the 2020 election was, quote, the most secure in American history. And if he wants to improve the numbers in his own party that he just mentioned of people believing in our elections, maybe he should start consulting with them. Or maybe he should start consulting with former Attorney General Barr, who said that he has found no evidence of widespread fraud in the 2020 election. We don't have to go back to 1877, my colleague. Senator Cruz knows that 80 judges, including conservative judges, including judges confirmed in this chamber, nominated by President Trump, has thrown out these lawsuits, calling them baseless, inadequate, and contrary both to the plain meaning of the constitutional text and common sense. And he knows that all 10 living defense secretaries, including both of Trump's defense secretaries, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, William Cohen, he knows that all these leaders have come together to say that these scurrilous attacks on our democracy must stop and we must allow for a peaceful transition of power. Senator Sinema will fill you in on the specific facts as to why this election was sound and true in Arizona, but a summary. President Trump received 1,661,686 votes in the state. President-elect Biden won 1,672,143 votes, meaning that he won the state by 10,457 votes. 
On November 30th, after Arizona's Republican governor, the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, and the conservative Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court certified the results of the election, the governor actually said, we do elections well here in Arizona. The system is strong. Eight post-election lawsuits brought in Arizona to challenge the results were dismissed by judges. Nine members of the House from Arizona were elected in the same election, including four Republicans. And colleagues, I did not see Senator Cruz over at their swearing-in in the House of Representatives last Sunday asking for an audit. He did not stop their swearing-in because there was no fraud. And he did not ask for an audit because we had a fair election. I will end with this. My friend Roy Blunt, my fellow Rules Committee leader, many years ago found a statue, a bust of a man at the top of a bookcase. He did research, he went to the historians, and all he could find out was that no one knew who this guy was, except that he was a cleric. Hence the statue is called the Unknown Cleric. Now at the time our leaders thought this man important enough that they would warrant a statue for him but today no one knows who he is. Senator Blunt's message to school kids and senators alike that visit his office when he shows them the statue, what we do here is more important than who we are. Senators, what matters is not our futures, not our own short-term destinies. What matters is our democracy's destiny. Because I think many of us know that people will not know who we are a hundred years from now, or two hundred years from now. But what they will know is this. They will know what we did today, how we voted today, and that is more important than who we are. It's a republic if we can keep it. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Charlie Leader. I yield up to five minutes to the Senator from Pennsylvania, Senator Toomey. Senator from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. President, and I intend later to address the specifics of Pennsylvania if and when an objection is raised with regard to Pennsylvania. For now, I want to address my remarks to what I think is the fundamental question being posed by the objectors. And that is, does Congress have the constitutional authority to decide which state's electoral college votes should be counted and which should not based on how well we think they ran their elections? This is what the objectors are really asking us to do, to federalize elections by rejecting electoral college votes from states whose processes they say they disapprove of, and thereby having Congress select the President of the United States instead of the American people. The answer, Mr. President, is no, there is no such authority under the Constitution. The Constitution assigns to the states the responsibility to conduct elect elections, it's clear in Article 2, Section 1. It leaves courts with the responsibility to adjudicate disputes, and it assigns to Congress the ministerial function of counting ballots, except for extreme circumstances, such as when a state sends competing slates of electors to Congress. Which brings me to the 1877 precedent. Some objectors claim to merely want a commission to conduct an audit and then let states decide whether to send different electors. Well, first, the situations are not at all analogous. In 1877, Congress had before it two slates of electors from several states. Here, there are no Trump electors from swing states. There's just Biden electors. Second, legislatures from the swing states, they've already spoken. They've made their decision. They've chosen not to send us alternative electors. Third, a commission, really? It's completely impractical, and we all know it. With 14 days to go, before a constitutionally mandated inauguration. But look at it this way. If the objectors are right, and it really is Congress's job to, to sit in judgment on the worthiness of the state's electoral processes, then what's the criteria for acceptable election processes? What investigations have been conducted of these processes? What body has deemed that certain states' processes are unacceptable? What opportunities were these states given to challenge the findings? Why are the objectors objecting only to swing states that President Trump lost? What about the ones he won? I don't know, North Carolina. What, what about California? They have ballot harvesting, I'm told. If this is all supposed to be Congress's job, you'd think we'd have answers to these questions 
and procedures in place because we would have done this every four years, right? But we don't because it's not our job. If we adopt this new president that we sit in judgment of states' processes, then we're federalizing the election law. We would necessarily have to establish the permissible criteria and rules for the state's elections. The ballot harvesting example. It's illegal in some states. It's encouraged in others. Does it become mandatory or forbidden depending on who's in control of Congress? And as the leader pointed out, it would be the end of the Electoral College. And the Electoral College is the mechanism by which the people select the president. But if Congress gets to decide which states get to vote in the Electoral College, then clearly Congress is selecting the president, not the people. Whichever party controls both houses of Congress would control the presidency. The public would never tolerate Congress picking the president instead of themselves, so they'd abolish the Electoral College, as many of our colleagues would like to do. And the end of the Electoral College, of course, means the nation will be governed by a handful of big blue states and regions that can drum up very large numbers. Mr. President, the Constitution does not assign to Congress the responsibility to judge the worthiness of state election processes nor its adherence to its rules. That's the responsibility of the states and the courts. Let me conclude with this. I voted for President Trump. I publicly endorsed President Trump. I campaigned for President Trump. I did not want Joe Biden to win this election. But there's something more important to me than having my preferred candidate sworn in as the next president, and that's to have the American people's chosen candidate sworn in as the next president. A fundamental defining feature of a democratic republic is the right of the people to elect their own leaders. It's now our duty, it's our responsibility to ensure that that right is respected in this election and preserved for future elections. I urge you, vote against this objection. Democratic leader. Well, Mr. Vice President, the Senator from the great state of Arizona, Senator Sinema. Senator from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today to share the facts about Arizona's recent election and to urge my colleagues to step away from divisive political rhetoric and step towards renewing Americans' faith in our democracy. The 2020 Arizona election was a success, not for any one party or individual, but as a demonstration of the will of the voters. A record 80% of registered voters participated, thanks to local Arizona election officials who ensured our system worked and our laws were upheld. Arizona has offered early voting for more than 100 years, and our vote-by-mail system includes strict safeguards. All ballots include tracking mechanisms and tamper-resistant envelopes. Election staff are trained to authenticate signatures, and Arizona imposes severe criminal punishments for ballot tampering. The Arizona election produced bipartisan results in which members of both parties won races, and these results have been confirmed by stakeholders across the political spectrum. The Republican chairman of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors said, no matter how you voted, this election was administered with integrity, transparency, and in accordance with Arizona state laws. The Republican speaker of the Arizona State House rejected calls for the legislature to overturn the election, saying, as a conservative Republican, I don't like the results of the presidential election, but I cannot and will not entertain a suggestion that we violate current law to change the outcome. Eight challenges contesting the Arizona election were brought to federal and state courts. All eight were withdrawn or dismissed, including a unanimous ruling by the Arizona Supreme Court. The Chief Justice wrote, the challenge fails to present any evidence of misconduct or illegal votes, let alone establish any degree of fraud or a sufficient error rate that would undermine the certainty of the election results. During a recent committee hearing, I asked a simple question of the former Director of Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security. Did he find any evidence disputing the integrity or fairness of Arizona's election? His answer was simple, no. Arizona and our 15 counties should be congratulated for running a secure election. Perhaps the most heartening demonstration of Arizona's election success is Jocelyn from Phoenix. 
Jocelyn is 18 years old and was a first-time voter in 2020. So was Rachel from Tucson and thousand more Arizonans who for the first time exercised their constitutional right to decide their own leaders. Today's challenge to Arizona's election fails any factual analysis. More disturbingly, it seeks to rob Jocelyn and Rachel and more than three million Arizonans of a free, fair election. Those of us who are trusted with elected office are first and foremost public servants. We serve our constituents. We do not seek to substitute our personal ambitions for the will of the American people. Our system allows for a continuous contest of ideas, and those voters who support the losing side of a free, fair election have not been disenfranchised. Rather, they maintain just as an important a voice in America's future, and leaders have a duty to serve all of our constituents, including those who voted for other candidates. Great leaders in our history face the choice of whether to take an action strengthening our democracy, even if a different action would better serve their political ambitions. Many are revered today because they chose our republic over their self-interests, including my personal hero, Senator John McCain. Following his presidential loss, Senator McCain said, the American people have spoken. Senator Obama and I have argued our differences and he has prevailed. Whatever our differences, we are fellow Americans. He spoke to the nearly 60 million Americans who voted for him, saying, it is natural tonight to feel some disappointment, but tomorrow we must move beyond it and work together to get our country moving again. Senator McCain was right. Today we have serious, significant work to do, beating this pandemic and reviving our economy. I urge my colleagues to follow the example of Senator John McCain and so many others, reject this meritless challenge, and uphold the will of Arizona voters. Thank you. Majority Leader. Mr. President, I <coughs> yield up to five minutes to the Senator from Oklahoma, Senator Lankford. Senator from Oklahoma. Mr. President, in America, we settle our differences in elections. But what happens if you don't trust the election count or you're concerned that so many courts denied or dismissed cases within hours after they were given thousands of pages of evidence? The reason we have a Congress to settle our nation's divisions and the rules of the Senate make sure that every opinion in the nation is heard is so issues like this can be addressed. The constitutional crisis in our country right now is that millions of Americans are being told to sit down and shut up. Their opinions matter. During the electoral challenge on January the 6th, 2005, Senator Ted Kennedy stood on this floor and said this. He said, I commend the many thousands of citizens in Massachusetts and other states who insisted on treating today's electoral vote count in Congress as a meaningless ritual would be an insult to our democracy unless we register our own protest against the obviously flawed voting process that look, took place in so many states. We are hopeful, he said, that this major issue that goes to the heart of our democracy is now firmly implanted on the agenda for effective action by Congress." End quote. I agree. The United States Constitution does not allow me to assign different electors to a state, nor should it. The United States Constitution does not give the option to the Vice President of the United States to just unilaterally decide which states are in and out, and it should not. Each state decides its electors through its people. But a small group of senators, including myself, have demanded that we not ignore the questions that millions of people are asking in our nation. So we have proposed a constitutional solution. Pause the count. Get more facts to the states before January the 20th. We proposed a 15-member commission, just like what was done after the failed election of 1876. They to, we're encouraging people to spend 10 days going through all the issues so states can have one last opportunity to address any challenges. Then the states, as the Constitution directs, 
would make the final decision on their electors. I have some colleagues who have said that a 10-day commission is not enough time, so they have counter-proposed, just ignoring the lingering questions. We need to do something. My challenge today is not about the good people of Arizona. And it will stand in recess until the call of the chair. We'll pause. Protesters are in the building. Thank you. There wasn't anything you said.
go back into recess.
be pretty. Nope. They're amassing on one side to drive them all back or take them all into custody. Yeah, him. Hey, Jamie, can you hear me? Is that a pretty fair assessment? What I sent? Just okay, so the police are moving in a way that looks like they're going to sweep from uh, from one side to the other and move in on these protesters. They're all staging in one side. The idea would be they would go up in mass and and push the protesters out. So we want to maybe keep an eye on this here. Yeah, the police are massing. And tactical vehicles are pulling up to the Capitol. Are we good here? Okay, two things. Uh, like tactical SWAT type vehicles.
used to call a third world country, we'd be reporting this and saying, oh, this is a coup attempt. But this is here in the United States of America. And so it seems foreign for us.
Yeah, and again, was a guy who claimed to be on the inside of the U.S. Capitol building with a couple other people, including his team, that, according to him, could be shot and killed by you know, how far they got inside, or whether they got inside or not, or, you know.
you fake news, you must be or you respond. I'm with the Associated Press. as little as possible, but give them, give them their due. Hey. They're out here bearing the cold with all of us. I was an AP guy. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure you know Rip Dinsolo or Dan Huff. Yeah, I remember Jenny, you remember uh, John Wilson, Jenny 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 Wilson, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, you get it, man. You got some good stuff, man. Yeah, man. It's gonna be a long night. Hope you stay safe out there. Oh, man. 
It's already windy as is right here. I'm dead. <laughs>
Hold on, I got you right now. Go ahead and ask the question. So if you see more, we got you. Check this out. Bring it out. His head and his hands were like, 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 were right like what? It said Christ. His head and his hands. Speak about his hair, his mustache, and his beard. The color was white first. And the texture was fully in. We're going to keep going on it. All right, and you let me get 2nd Maccabees 348. 1st Maccabees 348. This is the question. Listen to some history, all right? Listen to history. All right, what is the ancient Europe? What is Europe named after? Who is Europe named after? Who is Europe named after? And who is Europa? A Phoenician goddess. And what did the ancient Phoenicians look like? And what did the ancient Phoenicians look like? And what did the ancient Phoenicians look like? What, I'm asking you a question, I'll hear you. What did the ancient Phoenicians look like? Phoenicians were melanated people. You know why? Because the ancient Commissions who were in Egypt are melanated people. What, what DNA evidence do you want to prove? What, what DNA evidence do you want to prove? What do you want to prove? We got the facts right here, man. We got the facts right here. All right? We got the facts right here, okay? You're a liar. The white image of Christ is sent to the church here, the son of Pope Alexander VI. All right? You guys have all been fooled. You've been hoodwinked and thinking that Christ is a so-called white man. How the hell could Christ be a so-called white man and you went into Egypt and hid amongst the Egyptians? Right there. Egypt is also called what? Egypt is called Kemet, which means black land. All right? Let's see the biblical description of so-called Jesus Christ. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like as a fine bird. And his feet like a fine bird. No, Christ is a white man. As a fine bird. Christ is a white man with blue eyes and blonde hair. As a fine bird. It said Christ's feet were like unto fine grass. What? As if they burned in the fire. As if what? As if they burned in the fire. Christ's feet were fine grass as if they burned in the furnace. And the ancient Jews, the Jews of antiquity, were melanated people. They were all dark-skinned melanated people living in Northeast Africa at the time. Give me John 32. Okay, we all need to bring out the truth. If you think, if you think that the physique of Egyptians, all these other people were white, okay? If you think that his nose was white, something is wrong. Because right now, as we look at Israel, listen, people are catching skin cancer in Israel. We are not no idiot black men. You want to try to prove to me 2,000 years ago that the people would fight when they're catching skin cancer in Israel now. What's well, not true. John 832.
Hey, Jack. I sure do. Sure. Ah, uh, sure. Who is it? Oh, he's one of the stock talkers. Gotcha. Yeah, um, I, I, I can uh, I give you the address to my car as well. I just text it to you so we can forward it on to him. Does that sound good? It's, it's kind of south of the Supreme Court. I, I give him that general direction near the near the uh, South Capitol Hill metro stop, like a couple blocks uh, east of there. So. Yeah, a couple blocks south of there would be would be accurate. Cool. Sure, yeah, that sounds good. And I can meet him anywhere. So, uh, uh, yeah, and then am I good to come down? Is, is Dan established? I haven't found him yet. So. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Shut up. <laughs> it's in the car. So I can, I, I can meet him at a convenient spot now and then head back to the car so I can make his life easier. Okay. Awesome, hey, thanks for the update, Jack. Talk soon. Oh my God, who's
I'm sorry, not just an inconvenience, but I'm sorry for the reason we've delayed. I've delayed coming out to speak to you. I initially was going to talk about the economy, but all of you, all of you have been watching what I've been watching. At this hour, our democracy is under an unprecedented assault, unlike anything we've seen in modern times. An assault on the citadel of liberty, the capital itself. An assault on the people's representatives and the Capitol Hill police sworn to protect them, and the public servants who work at the heart of our republic. An assault on the rule of law like few times we've ever seen it. An assault on the most sacred of American undertakings, the doing of the people's business. Let me be very clear. The scenes of chaos at the Capitol do not reflect a true America do not represent who we are. What we're seeing are a small number of extremists dedicated to lawlessness. This is not dissent. It's disorder. It's chaos. It borders on sedition. And it must end now. I call on this mob to pull back and allow the work of democracy to go forward. You heard me say before in different contexts, the words of a president matter, no matter how good or bad that president is. At their best, the words of a president can inspire. At their worst, they can incite. Therefore, I call on President Trump to go on national television now to fulfill his oath and defend the Constitution and demand an end to this siege, to storm the Capitol, to smash windows, to occupy offices, the floor of the United States Senate rummaging through desks, on the Capitol, on the House of Representatives, threatening the safety of duly elected officials. It's not protest. It's insurrection. The world's watching. Like so many other Americans, I am genuinely shocked and saddened that our nation, so long the beacon of light and hope for democracy, has come to such a dark moment. Through war and strife, America has endured much. And we will endure here, and we will prevail again, and we'll prevail now. The work of the moment and the work of the next four years must be the restoration of democracy, of decency, honor, respect, the rule of law, just plain, simple decency, the renewal of the politics, it's about solving problems, looking out for one another, not stoking the flames of hate and chaos. As I said, America is about honor, decency, respect, tolerance. That's who we are. That's who we've always been. The certification of the Electoral College vote is supposed to be a sacred ritual, which we affirm purpose is to affirm the majesty of American democracy. But today's reminder, a painful one, that democracy is fragile, and to preserve it requires people of goodwill, leaders of the courage to stand up, who are devoted not to the pursuit of power, or the personal interest pursuits of their own selfish interest at any cost, but of the common good. 
Think what our children watching television is thinking. Think what the rest of the world is looking at. For nearly two and a half centuries, we, the people, in search of a more perfect union, have kept our eyes on that common good. America is so much better than what we've seen today. Watching the scenes from the Capitol, I was reminded as I prepared other speeches in the past, I was reminded of the words of Abraham Lincoln in his annual message to Congress, whose work has today been interrupted by chaos. Here's what Lincoln said. He said, we shall nobly save or merely lose the last best hope on earth. Went on to say, the way is plain, peaceful, generous, just. A way which, if followed, the world will forever applaud and God must forever bless. The way is plain here, too. That's who we are. It's the way of democracy, of respect, of decency, of honor, and commitment as patriots to this nation. Notwithstanding what I saw today and we're seeing today, I remain optimistic about the incredible opportunities. There has never been anything we can't do when we do it together. And this God-awful display today is bringing home to every Republican and Democrat and Independent in the nation that we must step up. This is the United States of America. There's never, ever, 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 ever been a thing we've tried to do that we've done it together. We've not been able to do it. So, President Trump, step up. May God bless America, and may God protect our troops and all those folks at the Capitol who are trying to preserve order. Thank you, and I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. Are you concerned about your inauguration, sir? Is there anything spoken to McConnell today? Are you concerned about your inauguration, sir? Are you concerned about violence? I am not concerned about my safety, security, or the inauguration. I am not concerned. The American people are going to stand up and stand up now. Enough is enough is enough.
like the inauguration all over again.
I was an LD at a concert club. Until they shut us down. What news organization?
5.30, is it worth powering down for a few minutes? No. Okay, after 5.30, power down and don't do it again until the 6th. Okay. That'll work. That's safe. I just don't want to lose your shot. Yeah. Well, it would stink to lose it for 6. What's that? It would stink to lose it for it 6. Would be yeah. It was only 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. Feels That's a lot colder than that, doesn't it? The wind. <laughs> Not the cold, it's the wind chill. Hey, can you, uh, she, she may be taking that at times. Is, is he, She's taking it? Uh, I don't know, but I would keep it take a bull. Worse than that. <laughs> Honestly, it's like last night, but tonight there's wind, which is a problem. Yeah, yeah this wouldn't be a bad gig, you know, because it's 65 degrees. Oh, yeah. Hanging out by the reflecting pool. Yeah. Yeah. I can, yes. Do you have my bite yet? By the way. <laughs> ah, shoot. Heard from BB Mayor Ariel Bowser. Ashley, you hear me? Do you hear me?
Yes. You hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, don't need that wind. I'm like in constant shivering mode now. <laughs> At least it's not raining. Thank you. And now it's true. Start. It's getting towards 5.30. Yeah. You're hit. Hold on. I got 5.27. Okay. She doesn't answer every time I talk to her. It's getting a little dark up there, too. I really can't see much anymore. Okay. Yeah, they definitely cleared. Are those mostly officers up there now? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's hard to say that. I can't tell. But they definitely cleared quite a bit off the Capitol itself. Okay. Then I have people just down below at the lower level. <laughs> Lights help. You can go to me, Ashley. That won't happen to me. Hey, let me get you in front of the camera real quick. I gotta do a lighting check.
seen it. He said unfucking believe it. I did. It is. Like them kicking. Oh, absolutely yeah, not. No, I was here for yeah, that too. Absolutely not. Yeah, all yeah. summer long I was playing off the game. Yeah. The Antifa in front of my house, I lived next door to Miss Katana. Oh, and they gosh. gave absolutely nothing. Yeah. Nothing. When I'm out there, they are shining laser pointers and threatening, and the cops stand there, they're like, well, what do you want us to do? I agree. Yeah. It's crazy. I, I wonder if you had a conversation with one of your private members. They'll talk so much banning and blocking all these people. It's just fun. It's just fun. Will this do any good? It depends on what you mean by good. It depends on what you mean by uh, by good, Mongo. Dang. Still nine, uh, almost 10K on YouTube. I love y'all. I'm walking away. I can get closer. All right, let's see. You had to have known that's from the YouTube blocks. Gosh, yeah, I got hit with a little tear gas, but I had uh, the protection. I had the full armor of God on. So I'm in front of a line of cops right now, son. Like, look at that. Look, there's all cops right there, and then a football field that way is people. What is going on? This is just a big crew. Yeah, thanks, thanks, y'all. Thanks for being good people. Yeah, so there's a line of cops over here. I don't think there's a line of cops over there, but there's nothing. I mean, I can go right up to the front again. So Penn certified, huh? That's like the big news of the day. And a lady got shot, supposedly. Yeah, I know it's hard to see. If you go over to YouTube, it's uh, it's the picture isn't as clear, but it's a lot brighter. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna be out too late. After, uh, yeah, I was inside the Capitol. Yes. Um, I mean, you can see it on YouTube. There's no point in it point in saying otherwise at this point not a liar also didn't i also did nothing illegal yeah i'll watch it i'll watch it i'll watch all this stuff when i get home you know a lot to do yeah 6 p.m curfew that's for sure yeah the white house did not get attacked um like the remnant video um thanks for the super heart i appreciate that <laughs> thank you might be wrong for being a quality friend didn't realize i was employing you for legal advice <laughs> I feel if Congress broke into my home, it'd be full. I can't fit nearly that many people in my home. Ooh. I miss no one's wearing masks. Oh, no, I love it. Weird. You gotta be
be more clever if you want to just say something and not get blocked, yo. Don't worry, people on YouTube. I'm just, I'm just dealing with the trolls over there on, on Periscope right now. I'm, I'm only like 10% serious about anything I'm saying. It's to draw them out. Now you're a hero for desecrating. I'm not a hero. I mean, who said I was a hero? getting divisive in there. <laughs> that's the pur that's a purge horn or whatever. Oh man. No one at any event has ever gotten COVID. understand everything to know that I, I see the same people at these events all the time. No one's ever gotten it from these events and we're like nose to nose with each other. Went down on Periscope. Let's see it again. The uh, wind is intense. Yeah, after this, I'm shutting it down. What's up, y'all? I don't know. Someone just called me, and I, I think I hit the, the wrong button. It's over. Yeah, it's over. Everyone's clearing out. Am I going to leave at curfew? I mean, I'm going to leave when I want to leave. I didn't, I don't know German, you know, German, I don't know how I was described in German, but I was, uh, you know, I was on Reuters and ABC, they, they got the rights to my stuff. Yeah, we're getting kicked out. I'm almost done here, folks. Das Kant. I love my Elon. I would say... Am I going back tomorrow? No. No, I'm, I'm leaving town tomorrow. I moved out of D.C. So I'm not, I'm not a local anymore. I was for 10 years, and now I'm not anymore. Oh. Soy be it 82 says with a terrorist. That's so funny, but you're banned. Soy be it. That is hilarious. Vanilla Isis. A thousand still. I mean, there's still thousands of people around, but they're not like aggressive anymore. So it's like you know, it's the thing. Yep, definitely not. <laughs> Can I get closer, like inside? No, it's funny though. Now this is the type of trolling I like. <laughs> Some of the people in the YouTube chat earlier were so funny. Dude. It was cracking me up. I would not ban you for saying you guys are a bunch of idiots. That's your opinion. I, I have a very specific set of skills. I'll, I'll keep you around for a little bit. Get in here. White Terrorist is my first punk band. Um, no, I'm not talking about anyone who uh, got a couple things about him that I absolutely hate, so it's like, um, you know, but I'm right wing. Uh, I don't know, 
I was there when the when the cops drew their guns and went upstairs. I don't know where it happened. Um, so I don't know. Why do people care so much about the president? That is the most fascinating thing about this whole thing. It's just like I don't really care that much, really. Like, what do you say? No more years, bitch. Get Trump's dick out of your mouth. You're banned. Um, but dude, I don't care all that much. It's fine. What is Biden? Do you think Biden is going to meet this psychopath? Oh, I love those guys. Uh, I'm kidding. Okay. These chicks don't even know the name of my band. Trump, I can kind of stand. So it's fine by me. It's fine by me. My band, my band, my band, my band. What do you mean, will I accept? Like, will I say in speech that he's my president? I don't know. It depends on my mood. I'm not like a violent person. So we don't accept. That's your guys' thing to do. I'll probably put an asterisk next to his name, yeah. But I do that with Barry Bonds, too. Why do I? I don't know. I try to care about people. Hey, why do you care about Biden? I'm going to kick it out of him. Yeah. Ladies, huh? All right. These chicks don't even know the name of my band. All right, I'm going to my car. I'm going to shut down the Periscope pretty soon just because it's, uh, I, need, I need a free hand. We just got ousted. They just to put the line up to the, uh, up to the uh, front of the Capitol, like the... Haters are always going to hate. Y'all need Jesus. I recommend believing in Jesus. That's what I think. You can chat here. That's true. Make sure you subscribe on all the platforms, guys. If you're digging it, if not, don't. I don't know. Um, you're blocked. You're banned. <laughs> you're banned. This is fun. <laughs> yeah, follow might be wrong. He is a good show. He's a great follow on uh, on Instagram. <laughs> Every time I'm singing that, I'm banning somebody. Yep. No, I'm not going back tomorrow. There's still 8,000 people on YouTube. You guys are awesome. You must be liking it. Um, oh, man, it's so easy to know who to ban. The left has guns, too. I know. I'm friends with a lot of leftists. Like, actually friends. You're banned. You're banned. Get over on Periscope, uh, YouTube people.
There was definitely smoke deployed. Hey, Jamie, it is now 6 p.m.
America fascist. Antifa is the complete opposite. They are not anti-fascist. They keep every technique out of the fascist Germany playbook. Every technique. I know that you guys, most of you guys are well
Guard mask, can you see? Yep. Do you want to let them know the. Okay. Hey, Jamie, 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 can you hear me? Jamie? Jamie?
demonstration and DC police need to move people around, you know, uh, basically every day of the week there's somebody yelling at a building in Washington. Uh, so this sort of thing is, is actually what the DC police know how to do. They do it very well and they are, they are moving the Trump supporters.
looking southeast of the country. We're in all black and have a mono car. inside the circle now. What will happen to them? I'm not sure. Uh, they could be reprimanded and let go or arrested uh, or held in detention. I'm not, not sure exactly. Uh, so uh, I'll give you a bit of an update. So today is of course January the 6th. Now, anyway, so today was of course January the 6th, and the joint session of Congress convened in the Capitol building behind us in order to count the electoral votes. Now, the people can be the protesters came here, probably numbering half a million to a million, somewhere in that range, in order to uh, support uh, President Trump and in order to call, call for an investigation into election fraud and election irregularities. And they were hoping for something to happen, perhaps for Mike Pence to uh, choose from the alternate slate of electors, or perhaps for the Congress to, in, in, their, uh, in their process, to reject some of the votes. So Mike Pence did not do that, and Nancy Pelosi announced that they will be counting votes all night. However, it looks like they will not be rejecting the votes. And, I mean, I, I, I can't tell the future, but it looks like Joe Biden will be certified. So, I think that's what people came down here to protest had in mind. Uh, they, once they reached the Capitol, they did breach the, the barrier. They went up to the rafters and they were eventually kicked out. And people were pushed back, 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 and back. We got preliminary reports that there was one fatality. Uh, I can't confirm that, but I've heard it from numerous sources. That's so all I can tell you. Probably by tomorrow we'll have confirmation on that. Uh, otherwise, this is the situation now. There's a curfew. There was a curfew for 6 p.m. It's now 7.40-ish uh, local time. And this is the situation on the ground in front of the Capitol building in the U.S. So we'll have more for you later tonight and tomorrow. Until next time, this is Roman. I'm signing off. Back up. You can record. Go back there. I'll see you.
like 20 degrees so uh we've been cold all day <laughs> yeah the cold kind of has been seeping seeping into everybody i feel at first it was fine then it got deeper and deeper and then it got into the bones um, yeah. <laughs> so there you have it this is the scene in front of the u.s capitol building here in washington dc i I saw them circling some people who really weren't going to do anything to stop it. They weren't you know, interacting with police, but they circled, pushed us back, and I think I left the building to go to. Yeah, but I saw the push here. All the writers. Yeah. I always say it's um, those individuals who refuse to leave. And I just about in case you were arrested, and it was maybe a uh, This is just a family. Uh, yeah. yeah. They, they literally, you know, circled. Yeah, no, no, I've been here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But did you see someone being taken away? I saw that whole group go off to the right. Yeah, they're not there anymore. I didn't literally see someone in front. Yeah. They, yeah, they definitely the vanished. They sort of moved forward. There's like a dozen people who literally mm -hmm. And you're right, they're not there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just going to say, like, 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 I drove there. Um, yeah, I saw I, I, I'm thankful you did that. Because, block, because Carol wanted me to go there from here. And then, yeah. you, then you popped up saying it was quiet. I was like, okay. Yeah, she did say here. I don't know. Are we still alive? Hopefully, you didn't start walking there. It could be yeah. nice, man. <laughs> well, I'll mention that it's, it's again, it's very cold to start of the day. During one interview, I thought I might actually collapse from the cold. All the way down past the two kids. I didn't. Basically. But if you were to maybe watch that interview, my hand is shaking. I try to control it, but it's a little tough. And I parked over there, but then they pulled us all out, so I drove the car back there. Not much else happening at the moment. I mean, it's just a kind of a standoff. It seems like everyone went home. I mean, you do have some erratic protesters here and there. Looks like there's some one flag waving <laughs> down in that direction. I don't know what that's to do. I don't know. What, what does this mean? Is this uh, sort of a preview for what, what the rest of the year is going to be like? And everyone looks like a movie nowadays. <laughs> Only time will tell. 
I can't really see in this specific area, but I guess they may be going to be. But if we need to camp out, man, you're more than welcome to hang out in my car. <laughs> I got an extra sandwich if you have any. I actually did just, uh, when they took me back to the house. Good. Are you even out since 6 a.m.? Uh, no, 10. 10 a.m. But I I had a bathroom break and ate a drink. <laughs> well, I was trying to you can stop if you want. Oh, okay. But you can well, I, I, I will mention it one day earlier night. But. Because I mentioned that during uh, one interview, we had we had our team here from that was streaming live to the Hong Kong uh, edition of the Epic Times. And, you know, I, I tried to explain a little bit to them about what was happening here to the Hong Kong people. And in so doing, you know, it kind of made me realize something. Because we were in Hong Kong last year, right? Some, some of the team members here and I were, were in Hong Kong. And there's uh, quite a bit of similarities Thank you. 
Yeah, see if you can find anyone. Maybe go back to the other one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know Jacqueline's still on the east side. Let's see what she knows. I think we got it. Yeah, they don't have the numbers. They should have been. They seem to be there. And what's crazy, um, just like near Union Station, I saw all these Fairfax County and Arlington cop cars coming in, reinforcements from Virginia. Really? <laughs> so, yeah, they probably called in. The, what time? Ooh. I would say right when I was kind of breaking, 2.30, 3.30, yeah, kind of that just afternoon where a lot of crap had already gone down, and, uh, yeah, Bowser said the uh, mayor had like a media call, yeah, everybody's got a problem, I'm thinking it's a problem, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she said she called in like Virginia State Police, Maryland State Police. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, because I think I'm still in the plane with the state of Maryland. Oh, without a doubt. Because they were, because they couldn't stay at the American Hotel. Yeah, after their leader got arrested for open carry and banned from the district. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> they literally knocked that. <laughs> they knocked that. I don't remember that. Yeah. 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 I don't have a I was I mean, right here was sort of the first moments of the breach when it was like yeah. the standoff on the steps. Yeah, you were up close. Huh? I was up close and then one of our was John. Who you got attacked? Um I think it was a still photographer just yeah. Yeah. yeah, we got like pushed over that stone. Yeah. Um, and that's when they pulled it. Yeah. Um, which I was happy to go. I mean that's covered by the hotel. Well, hold on, let me ask you this. Ash is going to be criminal. Egyptian soldier. Egyptian soldier. Please. I will. Here it's like, I wasn't there. I wasn't going to pull out my notebook ready. I feel for the time. Yeah. I was pretty lucky to know. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's great. And and part of the reason I think you prefer going solo. Because if you write me, I do. You, you're automatically got a cargo. And I was lucky tonight. I really didn't have too many people. There was one guy who took me, flipped me off, and blocked my camera. But that was it. No one, no one hit me or pushed me. And I got lucky. I was surprised he wasn't white. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, it's the dynamic compared to like the Tifa anti-journalism. Yeah. They'll scream in your face a lot. They will. And these guys just get these guys, but, but the these guys, these guys like, oh my god, I don't want to get stabbed. <laughs> I don't know who here has a gun. I don't know who here has Definitely I'm actually surprised there <laughs> has been Maybe that was one. some gunfire. Yeah, there was that one report of a girl. Somebody, a woman got shot in the building. The building. Yeah. I'm not sure who shot. Maybe the baby was gone. Somebody got shot. In the building. I'm surprised there was that proper gun. Yeah, like a more like back and forth. <laughs> I agree. I think there was some like women with meatballs. No, the cops were shooting. Yeah. The police, the police chief said that the protesters used chemical irritants on the police. Yeah, he, literally one of the three journalists was um, he was up there. He wasn't John, a uh, photographer, but a different John. He gave me some video of police and protesters that was playing each other, and uh, he had a great close of the police officer behind the line, in front of the inauguration stage, loading a confession with your and firing it up. Oh man, some good stuff, and I think we, we put it out right away. I that's what I was doing there in my lunch too. I, I edited that together real quick. It was a lot better stuff than I had gotten because I couldn't get close. 
my live signal kept going down. They didn't have any really? cell reception. Okay, yeah, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't upload anything. From yeah. When I was up near the steps, I couldn't get anything Did out. Did it keep going back and forth? Yeah. Oh, man, what a bummer. I want to see Mary Claire, who is uh, one of our congressional people, apparently, like, just dropped a load of photos and videos from inside. I didn't see, I, mean, I just saw people the phrasing them on WhatsApp. I haven't seen any footage. No, I'm not too sure. But that's probably some of the best stuff. Well, and Getty, I mean, like, on CNN, it was all Getty. On CNN, it was all Getty from inside the chamber. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I want to see a very clear for that. That has to be on one of our uh, top stories. Or something like that. So, no, no, I'm sure that OC News on it. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see if Jack's interested in that. If you... I mean, if you uh, they live on the, the live shot, I guess. Even if it's static, right? It's a nice shot. Yeah, it's nighttime. Everything's lit up. I mean, I'm glad they picked the parking lot here because there's chilly light. That's true. <laughs> if we're in the grass there, we'd be screwed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I think um, people are interested in seeing police protected even. Even if there's no, you know, not going to be protest here. 
Just to let everybody know, Bitcoin is still going up.
The Senate will come to order. The Vice President, as President of the Senate, would like to give a brief statement with the indulgence of the Senators. Today was a dark day in the history of the United States Capitol. But thanks to the swift efforts of U.S. Capitol Police, federal, state, and local law enforcement, the violence was quelled, the Capitol is secured, and the people's work continues. We condemn the violence that took place here in the strongest possible terms. We grieve the loss of life in these hallowed halls, as well as the injuries suffered by those who defended our capital today. And we will always be grateful to the men and women who stayed at their posts to defend this historic place. To those who wreaked havoc in our capital today, you did not win. Violence never wins. Freedom wins. And this is still the people's house. And as we reconvene in this chamber, the world will again witness the resilience and strength of our democracy. For even in the wake of unprecedented violence and vandalism at this Capitol, the elected representatives of the people of the United States have assembled again on the very same day to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. So may God bless the lost, the injured, and the heroes forged on this day. May God bless all who serve here and those who protect this place. And may God bless the United States of America. Let's get back to work. Mr. President. The Majority Leader. I ask unanimous consent the Majority Leader and the Democratic Leader be allowed to speak and that the time not count against two hours of debate in relation to the objection raised on the state of Arizona. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Without objection, so ordered. On the state of the American people, the United States Senate will not be intimidated. We will not be kept out of this chamber by thugs, mobs, or threats. We will not bow to lawlessness or intimidation. We are back at our posts. We will discharge our duty under the Constitution and for our nation. And we're going to do it tonight. This afternoon, Congress began the process of honoring the will of the American people and counting the Electoral College votes. We have fulfilled this solemn duty every four years for more than two centuries. Whether our nation's been at war or at peace, under all manner of threats, even during an ongoing, ongoing armed rebellion and the Civil War, the clockwork of our democracy has carried on. The United States and the United States Congress have faced down much greater threats than the unhinged crowd we saw today. We've never been deterred before and will be not deterred today. They tried to disrupt our democracy. They failed. They failed. They failed to attempt to obstruct the Congress. This failed insurrection only underscores how crucial the task before us is for our republic. Our nation was founded precisely so that the free choice of the American people is what shapes our self-government and determines the destiny 
of our nation. Not fear, not force, but the peaceful expression of the popular will. Now we assemble this afternoon to count our citizens' votes and to formalize their choice of the next president. Now we're going to finish exactly what we started. We'll complete the process the right way, by the book. We'll follow our precedents, our laws, and our Constitution to the letter. And we will certify the winner of the 2020 presidential election. Criminal behavior will never dominate the United States Congress. This institution is resilient. Our democratic republic is strong. The American people deserve nothing less. Democratic leader. Mr. President. Mr. President, it is very, very difficult to put into words what has transpired today. I have never lived through or even imagined an experience like the one we have just witnessed in this Capitol. President Franklin Roosevelt set aside December 7, 1941 as a day that will live in infamy. Unfortunately, we can now add January 6th 2021 to that very short list of dates in American history that will live forever in infamy. This temple to democracy was desecrated. Its windows smashed, our offices vandalized. The world saw Americans elected officials hurriedly ushered out because they were in harm's way. The House and Senate floors were places of shelter until the evacuation is, was ordered, leaving rioters to stalk these hallowed halls. Lawmakers and our staffs, average citizens who love their country, serve it every day, feared for their lives. I understand that one woman was shot and tragically lost her life. We mourn her and feel for her friends and family. These images, were projected to the world. Foreign embassies cabled home their, capital, their home capitals to report the harrowing scenes at the very heart of our democracy. This will be a stain on our country not so easily washed away. The final, terrible, indel indelible legacy of the 45th President of the United States, undoubtedly our worst. I want to be very clear. Those who perform these reprehensible acts cannot be called protesters. No, these were rioters and insurrectionists, goons and thugs, domestic terrorists. They do not represent America. They were a few thousand violent extremists who tried to take over the Capitol building and attack our democracy. They must and should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, hopefully by this administration, if not, certainly by the next. They should be, they should be provided no leniency. I want to thank the many of the Capitol Hill Police and Secret Service and local police who kept us safe today and worked to clear the Capitol and return it to its rightful owners and its rightful purpose. I want to thank the leaders, Democrat and Republican, House and Senate. It was Speaker Pelosi, Leader McConnell, Leader McCarthy, and myself who came together and decided that these thugs would not succeed, that we would finish the work of our that our Constitution requires us to complete in the very legislative chambers of the House and Senate that were desecrated, but we know always belong to the people and do again tonight. But make no mistake, make no mistake, my friends, today's events did not happen spontaneously. 
the president who promoted conspiracy theories that motivated these thugs, the president who exhorted them to come to our nation's capital, egg them on. He hardly ever discourages violence and more often encourages it. This president bears a great deal of the blame. This mob was in good part President Trump's doing, incited by his words, his lies. This violence in good part, his responsibility, his everlasting shame. Today's events certainly, certainly would not have happened without him. Now, January 6th will go down as one of the darkest days in recent American history. A final warning to our nation about the consequences of a demagogic president, the people who enable him, the captive media that parrots his lies, and the people who follow him as he attempts to push America to the brink of ruin. As we reconvene tonight, let us remember in the end, all this mob has really accomplished is to delay our work by a few hours. We will resume our responsibilities now, and we will finish our task tonight. The House and Senate chambers will be restored good as new and ready for legislating in short order. The counting of the electoral votes is our sacred duty. Democracy's roots in this nation are deep, they're strong, and they will not be undone, ever, by a group of thugs. Democracy will triumph, as it has for centuries. So to my fellow Americans, who were shocked and appalled by the images on their televisions today, and who are worried about the future of this country, let me speak to you directly. The divisions in our country clearly run deep, but we are a resilient, forward-looking and optimistic people. And we will begin the hard work of repairing this nation tonight, because here in America, we do hard things. In America, we always overcome our challenges. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Majority Leader. I yield two minutes to the Senator from Oklahoma, Senator Lankford. Senator from Oklahoma. The Vice President, you said things more eloquently than how we say it in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, we'd say something like, why in God's name would someone think attacking law enforcement and occupying the United States Capitol is the best way to show that you're right? Why would you do that? Rioters and thugs don't run the Capitol. We're the United States of America. We disagree on a lot of things, and we have a lot of spirited debate in this room. But we talk it out, and we honor each other, even in our disagreement. <laughs> that person, that person, that person is not my enemy. That's my fellow American. And while we disagree on things and disagree strongly at times, we do not encourage what happened today, ever. Uh, I want to join my fellow senators in saying thank you to the Capitol Hill Police, the Law Enforcement, the National Guard, the Secret Service, who stood in harm's way while we were here debating. They were pushing back. And I was literally interrupted mid-sentence speaking here because we were all unaware of what was happening right outside this room because of their faithfulness and because of what they have done. And I want to thank you them, thank them. Ronald Reagan once said, peace is not the absence of conflict. It is the ability to handle conflict by peaceful means. The peaceful people in my state in Oklahoma want their questions answered, but they don't want this, what happened today. They want to do the right thing, and they also want to do it the right way. They want to honor the constitutional process, but they also want to have debate about election security because they want to make sure it's right. 
which is why it's an important issue that still needs to be resolved. Transparency in government just doesn't seem like a bad idea. Obviously, the commission that we have asked for is not going to happen at this point, and I understand that. And we're headed towards tonight, towards the certification of Joe Biden to be the President of the United States. And we will work together in this body to be able to set a peaceful example for the days ahead. I yield the floor. Democratic Leader. Senator from Nevada, Senator Cortez Masto. Senator from Nevada. Mr. Vice President. I know that this room is full of leaders of both parties who love this country, and many believe that for America to succeed, our politics must find common ground. And that has never been clearer than today when armed rioters stormed the U.S. Capitol, emboldened by President Trump's false and inflammatory rhetoric about the 2020 elections. I believe that we in this chamber have a special duty as leaders to work together to lower the temperature of our politics. And I hope that my colleagues who have questioned the legitimacy of this election in Arizona and all of these other states now see the dire and dangerous consequences of sowing doubt and uncertainty. I also know that as U.S. Senators, we all take solemnly the oath we swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. At this moment in history, I can think of nothing more patriotic than renewing our faith in the charters of freedom that our founding fathers crafted for our republic, starting with the fundamental American principle in our Declaration of Independence that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. The people have spoken in this election, and our only job here today is to do what they ask. It is not to argue election security. That's not the place for what we are doing today. Our Constitution specifically reserves to the people the right to meet in their respective states and vote for the president and vice president. As a result, Individual states oversee and implement the election process, not the federal government. To guard against fraud or irregularities in the voting process, the states are required to have robust election security measures. Likewise, state legislatures have the opportunity to examine evidence of voter fraud before they certified their electoral college votes. And our courts, from district courts to the United States Supreme Court, adjudicate legal challenges and election disputes. All of those things happened after the 2020 election. State houses and courts across the country took allegations of voter fraud seriously and followed the constitutional process to hear challenges to this year's elections. No state found evidence of any widespread voter fraud, and neither did any court ask to review the state's findings in Arizona. Republican Governor Doug Ducey, Democratic Secretary of State Katie Hobbs, Republican Attorney General Mark Burnovich, and State Supreme Court Chief Justice Robert Brutonell all certify the results of the election on November 30th. And we know, we have heard, Arizonans have been voting by mail for almost 30 years. And Governor Ducey has expressed confidence in the state's process numerous times. In November, he said, we do elections well here in Arizona. The system is strong, and that's why I have bragged on it so much. He further stated, we have some of the strongest election laws in the country, laws that prioritize accountability and clearly lay out our procedures for conducting, canvassing, and even contesting the results. And they are right. Arizona has one of the most transparent election processes in the country with built-in accountability starting with eternal auditing. We have heard unfounded allegations that voting machines in Arizona and elsewhere somehow changed vote tallies or somehow improperly rejected ballots while claiming to accept them. These allegations all ignore the fact that Arizona counties 
conducted ballot audits by hand to double check the machine counts, and these audits found no widespread fraud or irregularities. Maricopa County, the county where the more than 60% of the state population resides, conducted a post-election hand count audit in the week after the election, which showed perfect 100% accuracy in the machine tabulations. So why would we need, my colleagues, to call for a 10-day emergency audit to be conducted by a legislative commission when it's already been done by the state of Arizona? What happened to states' rights? The audit involved checking ballots for the presidential election, but also ballots for federal and state legislative elections. The audit report shows every precinct's machine and hand count totals for each of the races audited. And for every single race in every precinct, the difference between the hand count and the machine count was zero. Maricopa's audit report stated, no discrepancies were found by the hand count audit boards. Seeking to find any reason to contest these results, some of the state Republicans then tried to claim that Maricopa County failed to follow state law in conducting this audit by selecting voting center locations to audit instead of voting precincts. This was wrong. And this, too, went to a court. In rejecting this claim, state court in Arizona found that the county followed the properly issued guidance on hand audit procedures from the Arizona Secretary of State. And the court found that Maricopa County officials, therefore, could not lawfully have performed the hand count audit the way the plaintiffs wanted it done. If they had done so, they would have exposed themselves to criminal punishment. The Senator's five minutes is uh, expired. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I would close by just saying, please, my colleagues, do not disenfranchise the voters of Arizona and certify their votes tonight. Thank you. Majority Leader. Mr. President, I yield up to five minutes to the Senator from Utah, Senator Lee. Senator from Utah. Mr. President, at the time I prepared my remarks for today, it seems like a lifetime ago. A lot's changed in the last few hours. And so I'm going to deliver some of the same remarks, but it has a little bit of a different feel than it would have just a few hours ago. My thoughts and prayers go out to the family members of those who have been injured or killed today. My heartfelt gratitude goes out to the Capitol Hill police who valiantly defended our building and our lives. Well, it's true that legitimate concerns have been raised with regard to how some of the key battleground states conducted their presidential elections. This is not the end of the story. We each have to remember that we've sworn an oath to uphold, protect, and defend this document, written nearly two and a half centuries ago by wise, wise men raised up by God to that very purpose. That document makes clear what our rule is and what it isn't. It makes clear who does what when it comes to deciding presidential elections. You see, because in our system of government, presidents are not directly elected. They're chosen by presidential electors. And the Constitution makes very clear under Article 2, Section 1, that the states shall appoint presidential electors according to procedures that their legislatures develop. Then comes the 12th Amendment. It explains what we're doing here today in the Capitol. It explains that the President of the Senate, the Vice President of the United States, shall open the ballots and the votes sh shall then be counted. It's those words that can find, define, and constrain every scrap of authority that we have in this process. Our job is to open and then count. Open, then count. That's it. That's all there is. Now, there are, of course, rare instances, instances in which uh, multiple Slates of electors can be submitted by the same state. That doesn't happen very often. It happened in 1960, it happened in 1876. Let's hope it doesn't ever happen again. In those rare moments, Congress has to make a choice. It has to decide which of the electoral votes will be counted and which will not. That did not happen here. Thank heavens, and let's hope that it never does. 
Now, many of my colleagues have raised objections or had previously stated their intent to raise objections with regard to these. Um, I, I've spent an enormous time on this issue over the last few weeks. I've met with lawyers on both sides of the issue. I've met with lawyers representing the Trump campaign, reading everything I could find about the constitutional provisions in question. And I've spent a lot of time on the phone with legislators and other, other leaders from the contested states. I didn't initially declare my position because I didn't yet have one. I, I, I wanted to get the facts first, and I wanted to understand what was happening. I wanted to give uh, the people serving in government in the contested states the opportunity to do whatever they felt they needed to do to make sure that their election was properly reflected. I spent an enormous amount of time reaching out to state government officials in those states, but in none of the contested states, no, not even one, did I discover any indication that there was any chance that any state legislature or secretary of state or governor or lieutenant governor had any intention to alter the slate of electors. That being the case, our job is a very simple one. This simply isn't how our federal system is supposed to work. That is to say, if you have concerns with the way that an election in the presidential race was handled in your state, the appropriate response is to approach your state legislatures, first and foremost. These protests, uh, from hearing from those who have raised concerns, they should have been focused on their state capitals, not their nation's capital because our role is narrow, our role is defined, our role is limited. Yes, we are the election judges when it comes to members elected to our own body. And yes, the House of Representatives, they're the judges of their own races there. We also have the authority to prescribe, as a Congress, rules governing the time, place, and manner of elections for senators and representatives. There is no corresponding authority with respect to presidential elections, none whatsoever. It doesn't exist. Our job is to convene, to open the ballots, and to count them. That's it. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Democratic leader. Senator from Colorado, Mr. Bennett. Senator thank from you. Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, um, it's been a terrible day for everybody here and, and, I, uh, and for our country. One of the things I was thinking about today is something I often think about when I'm on this floor, which is that the founders of this country, the people that wrote our Constitution, actually knew our history better than we know our history. And I was thinking about that history today as we saw the mob riot in Washington, D.C., thinking about what the founders were thinking about when they wrote our Constitution, which was what happened to the Roman Republic when armed gangs doing the work for politicians prevented Rome from casting their ballots for consuls, for praetors, for senators. These were the offices in Rome. And these armed gangs ran through the streets of Rome, keeping elections from being started, keeping elections from ever being called. And in the end, because of that, the Roman Republic fell and a dictator took its place. And that was the end of the Roman Republic, or any republic for that matter, until this beautiful constitution was written in the United States of America. So it is my fervent hope that the way that we respond to this today, my dear colleagues, is that we give the biggest bipartisan vote we can in support of our democracy and in support of our Constitution and in rejection for what we saw today and what the Roman Republic saw in its own time. There's a tendency around this place, I think, to, to, to always believe that we're the first people to confront something when that's seldom the case and to underappreciate what the effect of our actions will be. We need to deeply appreciate in this moment our obligation to the Constitution, 
our obligation to the democracy, our obligation to the republic. There are people in this chamber that have twisted the words, twisted the words of a statute written in the 19th century that was meant to actually settle our electoral dispute, to leave them with the states. As the senator from Utah was saying, to give us a ministerial role, except in very rare circumstances. That's what that law is about, that the senator of Texas was talking about today. And that's the law that's leading us to be asked to overturn the judgments of 60 courts in America, many of them courts in Arizona, some of whom have, have held the president's lawyers out of the courtrooms because there's no evidence of fraud. And by the way, the fact that 37% or 39% of Americans think there's no evidence of fraud or they think there's evidence of fraud does not mean there is fraud. If you turned a blind eye to a conspiracy theory, you can't now come to the floor of the Senate and say you're ignoring the people who believe the, the, the election was stolen. Go out there and tell them the truth, which is that every single member of this Senate knows this election wasn't stolen. And that we, just as in the Roman Republic, have a responsibility to protect the independence of the judiciary from politicians who will stop at nothing to hold on to power. There's nothing new about that either. That's been true since the first republic was founded. So now we find ourselves in a position just days after many senators here swore an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. Every single member of the House of Representatives swore the same oath as well. And I think we've got a solemn obligation and responsibility here to prove once again that this country is a nation of laws and not of men. And the only result that we can reach together is one that rejects the claim of the senator from Texas and the other members of the House and Senate who seek to overturn the decisions that are made by the states, by the voters in the states, and by the courts. If we follow what they have proposed, we will be the ones that will have disenfranchised every single person who cast a vote in this election, whether they voted for the president or they didn't. I urge you to reject this, and I deeply appreciate the opportunity to serve with every single one of you. Thank you, Mr. President. Majority Leader. I yield up to five minutes to the Senator from Georgia, Senator Leffler. Senator from Georgia. Mr. President, when I arrived in Washington this morning, I fully intended to object to the certification of electoral votes. However, the events that have transpired today have forced me to reconsider, and I cannot now in good conscience object to the certification of these electors. The violence, the lawlessness, and siege of the halls of Congress are abhorrent and stand as a direct attack on the very institution my, objected, my objection was intended to protect, the sanctity of the American democratic process. And I thank law enforcement for keeping us safe. I believe that there were last minute changes to the November 2020 election process and serious irregularities that resulted in too many Americans losing confidence, not only in the integrity of our elections, but in the power of the ballot as a tool of democracy. Too many Americans are frustrated at what they see as an unfair system. Nevertheless, there is no excuse for the events that took place in these chambers today, and I pray that America never suffers such a dark day again. Though the fate of this vote is clear, the future of the American people's faith in the core institution of this democracy remains uncertain. We as a body must turn our focus to protecting the integrity of our elections and restoring every American's faith that their, vo their voice and their vote matters. 
America is a divided country with serious differences, but it is still the greatest country on earth. There can be no disagreement that upholding democracy is the only path to preserving our republic. I yield the floor. Democratic leader. Senator Booker and two and a half minutes to Senator Payne. In reverse order. Senator from Virginia. I applaud the comments of my colleague from Georgia deeply. My first job after school was in Macon, Georgia, working for a federal judge, Lanier Anderson. And I learned a lot about integrity and a lot about law from him. I also learned some sad lessons that in the history of Georgia and indeed Virginia and many states, so many people, especially people of color, have been disenfranchised over the course of our history. Our late friend, John Lewis, congressman from Georgia, was savagely beaten on Bloody Sunday just for marching for voting rights. That act of violence inspired this body, the U.S. Senate, to come together in March of 1965 and work to pass, in a bipartisan fashion, the Voting Rights Act. We should be coming together today after acts of violence as a United States Senate to affirm the votes of all who cast ballots in November. Instead, we're contemplating an unprecedented objection that would be a massive disenfranchisement of American voters. The Georgia result was very clear, a 12,000 vote margin, two certifications by Republican officials, four separate recounts and canvases, seven lawsuits, as in the other states. If we object to results like this, the message is so clear. We are saying to states, no matter how secure and accurate your elections are, we'll gladly overthrow them if we don't like who you voted for. But more importantly, what we'll be saying, really what we'll be doing, is as the body that acted together to guarantee Americans the right to vote, we will become the agent of one of the most massive disenfranchisements in the history of this country. So I urge all of my colleagues, please oppose these objections. Thank you, and I yield to my colleague from New Jersey. Senator from New Jersey. Mr. Vice President, I can only think of two times in American history that individuals laid siege to our capital, stormed our sacred civic spaces, and tried to upend and overrun this government. One was in the War of 1812, and the other one was today. What's interesting about the parallel between the two is they both were waving flags to a sole sovereign, to an individual, surrendering democratic principles to the cult of personality. One was a monarch in England, and the other were the flags I saw all over our capital, including in the hallways and in this room, to a single person named Donald Trump. The sad difference between these two times is one was yet another nation in the history of our country that tried to challenge the United States of America. But this time, we brought this hell upon ourselves. My colleague from Texas said that this was a moment where there were unprecedented allegations of voter fraud. Yes, that is true. They were unprecedented when the president, before the election even happened, said, if I lose this election, then the election was rigged. That's unprecedented. It's unprecedented before the night of the voting, even the, the counting of the vote 
was even done that he called it rigged. And it's unprecedented that he is fanning the flames of conspiracy theory to create a smokescreen in this nation to cover what he is trying to do, which is undermine our democratic principles. But it's not just that. The shame of this day is it's being aided and abetted by good Americans who are falling prey, who are choosing Trump over truth, who are surrendering to the passion of lies as opposed to standing up and speaking truth to power, who are trying to fundraise off of the shame of conspiracy theories as opposed to doing the incalculably valuable patriotic thing to speak truth to our nation. Our democracy is wounded, and I saw it when I saw pictures of yet another insurgency, of a flag of another group of Americans who tried to challenge our nation. I saw the flag of the Confederacy there. What will we do? How will we confront this shame? How will we confront this dark second time in American history? I pray that we remember a Georgian his words, all I can say is we must in spirit join together like those Georgians on a bridge called the Edmund Pettus who joined hands, who were called threats to our democracy, who were called outrageous epithets when they sought to expand our democracy, to save it and to heal it, when they joined arm in arm and said what we should say now, commit ourselves to that ideal, that together we shall overcome. Majority Leader. Mr. President, I yield up to five minutes to the Senator from Nebraska, Senator Sass. Senator from Nebraska. Mr. President, thank you. And Mr. Vice President, let me just say before I begin, um, thank you for the way you have fulfilled your constitutional duties and your oath of office today. It obviously hasn't been easy. Um, colleagues, today has been ugly. And um, when I came to the floor this morning, I planned to talk about uh, the lesson of 1801, because I'm kind of a history nerd, and I wanted to celebrate the glories of the peaceful transition of power across our nation's history. It feels a little naive now to talk about ways that American civics might be something that could unite us in bringing us back together. 1801 blew everybody's mind all over the world, by the way. Uh, John Adams loses to Thomas Jefferson, and uh, Adams willingly leaves the executive mansion and moves back to Massachusetts, and Jefferson peacefully assumes power. And people all over Europe said, Those must be, that must be fake news. Those must be bad reports. There's no way any executive would ever willingly lay down power. And yet Adams, in defeat, did something glorious to give all of us a gift. I wanted to celebrate that. And it feels a little bit harder now. This building has been desecrated. Blood has been spilled in the hallways. Um, I was with octogenarian members of this chamber that needed to have uh, troops and police stabilize them to get down the stairs at a time when a lot of our staffs were panicked and under their desks and not knowing what was gonna happen to them. It was ugly today. But you know what? It turns out that when something's ugly, talking about beauty isn't just permissible. Talking about beauty is obligatory in a time like that. Why? Why would we talk about beauty after the ugliness of today? Because our kids need to know that this isn't what America is. What happened today isn't what America is. They've been given a glorious inheritance. This is the 59th presidential election. If the vice president wasn't the chair and if the president pro chem was, I'd have made some joke that Chuck Grassley has voted in two thirds of those 59 presidential elections. <laughs> He's, he's laughing. Uh, it's not as good as d hit deer, deer dead, but it's still got a grassly laugh. Um, I don't think we want to tell the Americans that come after us that this republic is broken, that this is just a banana republic, that our institutions can't be trusted. I don't think we want that. We don't want that in this body. We don't want that in our hometowns. I don't think we want to tell our kids that America's best days are behind us because it's not true. That's not who we are. America isn't Hatfields and McCoys, blood feud forever. America's a union. 
There's a lot that's broken in this country, but not anything that's so big that the American people can't rebuild it, that freedom and community and entrepreneurial effort and that neighborhoods can't rebuild. Nothing that's broken is so big that we can't fix it. Generations of our forefathers and our foremothers, probably not a word, our ancestors, have spilled blood to defend the glories of this republic. Why would they do that? Because America is the most exceptional nation in the history of the world and because the Constitution is the greatest political document that's ever been written. Most governments in the past have said might makes right, and we saw some of that thuligan nuttery today. Might makes right, no it doesn't. God gives us rights by nature, and government is just our shared project to secure those rights. America has always been about what we choose to do together, the way we reaffirm our constitutional system, where we've got some governmental tasks, and we all in this body could do better at those governmental tasks, but the heart of America is not government. The center of America is not Washington, D.C. The center of America is the neighborhoods where 330 million Americans are raising their kids and trying to put food on the table and trying to love their neighbor. That's the center of America. We're not supposed to be the most important people in America. We're supposed to be servant leaders who try to maintain a framework for ordered liberty so that there's a structure that back home where they live, they can get from the silver frame of structure and order to the golden apple at the center, as Washington would have said it, which is the things that they build together the places where they coach Little League, the places where they invite people to synagogue or church. Sometimes the big things we do to death together are governmental, like kicking Hitler's ass or like going to the moon. Sometimes there is governmental stuff, but the heart of America is about places where moms and dads are raising kids and we're supposed to serve them by maintaining order and by rejecting violence. You can't do big things like that if you hate your neighbors. You can't do big things together as Americans if you think other Americans are the enemy. Look, there's a lot of uncertainty about the future. I get it. There's a lot that does need to be rebuilt. But if you're angry, I want to beg you, don't let the screamers who monetize hate have the final word. Don't let nihilists become your drug dealers. There are some who want to burn it all down. We met some of them today, but they aren't going to win. Don't let them be your prophets. Instead, organize, persuade, but most importantly, love your neighbor. Visit the widower down the street who's lonely and doesn't want to tell anybody that his wife died and he doesn't have a lot of friends. Shovel somebody's neighbor. Or some, shovel somebody's driveway. You can't hate somebody who just shoveled your driveway. The heart of life is about community and neighborhood, and we're supposed to be servant leaders. The constitutional system is still the greatest order for any government ever, and it's our job to steward it and protect it Let's remember that today when we vote. Democratic leader. Mm -hmm. One candidate, Durbin. Senator from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. In March of 1861, a Springfield lawyer caught a train to Washington. His name was Abraham Lincoln. It wasn't his first trip here. He'd served as a congressman 15 years before, and he returned in the beginning of the Civil War to serve as president. It was a different place than he knew it as congressman, and 15 years it had changed a lot. The Spriggs boarding house across the street, which is now the Library of Congress, was gone. And this building was changing, big changes. They were building a dome on the Capitol. But they were also in the earliest days of a war, and President Lincoln was counsel Stop building the dome. It costs too much money and we can't spend any more time on it. And he said, no, we're going to build that dome and we're going to finish it. That dome and this building will be a symbol of this country that will survive the Civil War and come back strong. So they built the dome. They won the war. And since those days, that dome and this building have been a symbol to this country a symbol of unity and of hope. Tourists come through here before COVID-19 by the tens of thousands. And if you've ever noticed their tours, they're often shushed. People are saying, show some respect for this building. 
We know this building in the rotunda as a place where some of the greatest American heroes of both political parties lie in state, and we go there to honor them. We know this building because we work here. We enact laws here that change America. We gather for State of the Union messages from presidents and honor the people in the gallery. This is a special place. This is a sacred place. But this sacred place was desecrated by a mob today on our watch. This temple to democracy was defiled by thugs who roamed the halls and sat in that chair, Mr. Vice President, the one that you vacated at 2.15 this afternoon, sat and posed for pictures, those who were roaming around this chamber. What brought this on? Did this mob spring spontaneously from America? No. This mob was invited to come to Washington on this day by this president for one reason, because he knew the Electoral College vote was going to be counted this day. He wanted this mob to disrupt the constitutional process which we are part of. This mob was inspired by a president who cannot accept defeat. If you wonder whether I'm going too far in what I say, just read the transcript with the Secretary of State from Georgia and listen to this president's wild conspiracy theories, one after the other, swatted down by that Republican elected official and his attorney as having no basis in fact. This president begs, he coaxes, he even threatens that Secretary of State to find the votes he needs. In any other venue, that would be a simple, obvious crime. The links he will go to are obvious. The Texas senator says to us, well, many people still agree with him, you know, when it gets down to the bottom line. Many people have fallen for this presidential position that it must have been a rigged election if I lost. Well, I would say that after We've lost count. 57 lawsuits, 62 lawsuits, I've heard so many numbers, after 90 different judges, after this president took his case, the best he could put together, to the highest court in the land across the street where he had personally chosen three justices on the Supreme Court, I say to the senator from Texas, you know much more about that court than I do. I don't believe they let that paper that he sent up there even hit the desk before they left it out of the court. And that's the best he had to offer. No evidence whatsoever of this rigged election and this fraudulence. The senator from Texas says, we just want to create a little commission. 10 days, we're going to audit all the states, particularly the ones in, a, in contention here, and find out what actually occurred. And it really draws its parallel to 1876, Hayes and Tilden. Don't forget what that commission, that so-called political compromise, achieved. It was not just some ordinary governmental commission. It was a commission that killed Reconstruction, that established Jim Crow, that even after a civil war which tore this nation apart, it re-enslaved African Americans. And it was a commission that invited the voter suppression we are still fighting today in America. Let me close by saying this. The vote we're going to have here is a clear choice of whether we are going to feed the beast of ignorance or we are going to tell the truth to the American people. We saw that beast today roaming the halls. Let's not invite it back. Majority Leader. President, I yield up to five minutes to the Senator from Kansas, Senator Marshall. Senator from Kansas. Thank you, Mr. President. Freedom of speech and the freedom to protest are provided in our Constitution. And while I share the same frustrations many Americans have over the presidential election, the violence and mob rule which occurred at the U.S. Capitol today and across the country over the past year are unacceptable, and I condemn them at the highest level. And like all of us in the chamber, I'm thankful for the heroic law enforcement officers who worked feverishly to restore orders so that we get back to the electoral certification process. 
During my 29-year career as an obstetrician and gynecologist, too often I had to sit down with patients and give them a very bad diagnosis. It might have been a young mother of three who I delivered all three of her babies now with metastatic breast cancer, or perhaps another woman with advanced cervical or ovarian cancer, all with a very challenging prognosis. But before I sat down with each one of those patients, I carefully reviewed all their labs, their x-rays and their pathology to make sure I had the facts straight. But at the end of the day, my final recommendation was always going to be a recommendation from my heart. I want my fellow Kansans and all Americans to know that I've given as much consideration and thought surrounding the issue objecting to a state's electoral college votes as I did considering the treatment plan for a serious health concern. And today's decision, once again, is from my heart. Mr. President, I rise today to restore integrity to our republic. And I rise to join the many of our colleagues who are all concerned for current and future generations. We must restore faith and confidence in one of our republic's most hallowed patriotic duties, voting. There is no question our U.S. Constitution empowers state legislatures to execute free, legal, and fair elections. Unfortunately, in several states, the clear authority of those state legislatures to determine the rules for voting were, were usurped by governors, secretaries of states, and activist courts. Our laws and constitution should always be followed, especially in a time of crisis. I don't rise and do a state's legally obtained electoral college votes. Rather, I rise in hopes of improving the integrity of the ballot to hold states accountable to the time-proven constitutional system of the electoral college. This is why I urge the formation of an electoral commission to give constructive suggestions and recommendations that states can make to make our elections once again safe, free, and fair after a year of jarring irregularities. We must and will have a peaceful transition to power. To all my fellow Americans, I have no doubt that our republic can go stronger through this difficult day. May God bless this great republic. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield back. Democratic leader. Senator Duckworth. Senator from Illinois. President, in 2004, I packed up my rucksack, laced up my boots, and deployed to Iraq ready to sacrifice whatever was asked of me, all because I love this nation, willing to sacrifice my life if needed, because I believe in the sanctity of our electoral system, which had declared George W. Bush my commander-in-chief. I earned my wounds, proudly fighting in a war I did not support on the orders of a president I did not vote for, because I believed in and I still do believe in the values of our nation because I believe in a government of, by, and for the people where voters, voters choose who leads them, not the other way around. I have spent my entire adult life defending our democracy, but I never, never thought it would be necessary to defend it from an attempted violent overthrow in our nation's own Capitol building. Well, I refuse to let anyone intent on instigating chaos or inciting violence deter me from carrying out my constitutional duties. You know, when my Army buddies and I raised our right hands, when the 45,000 troops in Arizona raised their right hands and swore to protect and defend the Constitution, we did not qualify our oath by saying that we'd follow orders only when the commander-in-chief was someone whose election we were happy with. Just like when every senator in this chamber was sworn into office, we didn't mutter under our breath that we discharge our duties only when it served our political interests or helped us to avoid the wrath of a petty, insecure, wannabe, tin pot dictator on the precipice of losing power and relevance. No. There is no ambiguity here. Joe Biden won the election with a record number of votes. Republican officials nationwide confirmed those results, including in Arizona, as has judge after Trump appointed judge. Even Trump's attorney general admitted that the United States Department of Justice had not found widespread fraud that would have affected the outcome. Yet still, 
Many of my Republican colleagues are asking us to ignore all of that. With no evidence of their own, they're asking us to ignore court rulings, ignore the flag of our country, a flag of the United States of America. On, on it, it says, one country, one destiny. One country, one destiny, written on the flag. That was also what was embroidered in Abraham Lincoln's coat that he had on that fateful night. Lincoln's party, Lincoln's message, one country, one destiny. So on this holy day of Epiphany, let us pray. I'm a big believer in prayer. Let us pray that there will be peace on earth and that it will begin with us. Let us pray that God will continue to bless America. And with that, let us proceed with our responsibilities to the Constitution to which we have just within 72 hours taken the oath to uphold. But what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition to the objection. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, it is a sad day in America. It is a wrenching day in America. It, a day, it is a day in which our words and our actions have had consequences of a very, very negative nature. We ought to watch our words and think what it may mean to some. My remarks uh, were written before the tragic, dangerous, and unacceptable actions. And un unacceptable is such a tame word. My remarks started with Madam Speaker. The American people today are witnessing one of the greatest challenges to our democracy in its 2244-year 20, history. Little did I know that this capital would be attacked by the enemy within. I was here on 9-11 when we, we were attacked by the enemy without. We need to all work together to tame and reduce the anger and, yes, the hate that some stoke. What some, not all, Madam Speaker, but some in this House and in this Senate are doing today will not change the outcome of the election, which is the clear and insurmountable victory of President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris. Instead, all they will accomplish is to further the dangerous divisions. This was written before this capital was assaulted. Before this democracy was put aside by thousands. Encouraged by the commander in chief. Instead, all they will accomplish is to further the dangerous divisions, as I said, among our people and energize conspiracy theories stoked by our foreign adversaries, which seek to erode America's confidence in our democracy and our system of free and fair elections. I was here in 2000. I was strongly in favor of Al Gore for president. 
And my candidate got more votes than the other candidate. His name was George Bush, of course. And one of the saddest days was January 20th of 2001, when uh, our candidate, who won the election in my view, was not elected. But it was also one of the proudest moments of my career, because the greatest power on earth passed peacefully from Bill Clinton to George W. Bush. Not a shot was fired. Nobody assaulted this caucus or this Congress or this chamber because we were not disappointed, no. Because we were not angry, no. Because we believe in democracy. We believe in we the people. And the way the people, one of the speakers, I think it was the senator from Texas expressed, we're here for the people. If those were the people, we are in a lot of trouble. Our electoral system, our democratic system, however, did not break under the strains of the misinformation, the claims of fraud, which court after court after court have dismissed out of hand. Not because there was a little evidence, because there was no evidence. That's why we're the longest lasting constitutional democracy in the world. I hope all of us in this body are proud of that and understand why that's the case. Because, as Dick Gephardt said on this floor many years ago, democracy is a substitute for war to resolve differences. It proved once more than ever beating strong heart that gives life to our republic and our freedoms. That strength, Madam Speaker, is derived in part from our institution and our laws. But most importantly, it is powered by citizens and leaders' commitment to our Constitution. Not just us, we swear an oath. But it's all of America. Barack Obama spoke from that chamber and he said, uh, I'm going to be taking another title next year, citizen. And he was proud to take that. And every citizen needs to protect, preserve, and uplift our democracy. Some today did not do that. Many today. 68 years ago in Springfield, Illinois, Governor Adlai Stevenson gracefully conceded his loss to General Dwight Eisenhower. He said this, in traditionally, it is traditionally American, he told his deeply disappointed supporters, to fight hard before an election. But then he added, it is equally traditional to close ranks as soon as the people have spoken, not the Congress, not the electors, the people have spoken. That which unites us as American citizens is far greater than that which divides us as political parties. It was another man from Springfield, four score and eight years earlier, who won re-election to the presidency in a national crisis that tested our country and its democratic institutions who pleaded even in his hour of victory for the same spirit of reconciliation. That was the party of Lincoln. That hasn't happened to this hour. Lincoln said, now that the election is over, uh, he asked, may not all, having a common interest, reunite in a common effort to save our common country. Such is the duty of an American who stands for elections or participates in our politics to be either humble in triumph or gracious in defeat. I've lost some elections, not too many. And I've won a lot of elections. And I hope that I've been gracious in defeat and humble in victory. 
I hope that I put my state and my country first, not myself. It is clear to all that the outgoing president has not followed the path that Stevenson and Lincoln urged. So we the people, each one of us represents about 750 to 800,000 people, some a few more less. The people, and they've spoken in the way that our Constitution set for them to be heard by us and by the country. They voted, and they voted pretty decisively. We, the people, together must turn away from divisions and its dangers. The senior member of our body, Don Young from Alaska, spoke the other day when we were sworn in and said, ladies and gentlemen of this house, we are so divisive that it's going to destroy our country. We need to reach out and hold one another's hands. We all have a title that we honor more than any other perhaps parent, perhaps husband, but we are all Americans. Not Americans are, not Americans D. We are Americans. Let us hope today that tonight that we act like Americans, not as D's and R's, but as Americans. Just as Al Gore, just as uh, Hillary Clinton, just as Adlai Stevenson, just as Abraham Lincoln, who had won that election, of course. But he had defeated people, and he said, that's not the issue. The ...objected to as an example of why people are concerned, millions of Americans concerned about our election integrity. The state of Pennsylvania, quite apart from allegations of any fraud, you have a state constitution that has been interpreted for over a century to say that there is no mail-in balloting permitted, except for in very narrow circumstances that's also provided for in the law. And yet, last year, Pennsylvania elected officials passed a whole new law that allows universal mail-in balloting and did it irregardless of what the Pennsylvania Constitution said. And then when Pennsylvania citizens tried to go and be heard on this subject before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, they were dismissed on grounds of procedure, timeliness, in violation of that Supreme Court's own precedent. So the merits of the case have never been heard. The constitutionality of the statute actually has never been defended. I'm not aware of any court that has passed on its constitutionality. Actually, I'm not aware of anybody who's defended the constitutionality. And this was what, this was the statute that governed this last election in which there are over 2.5 million mail-in ballots in Pennsylvania. This is my point, that this is the forum. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court hasn't heard the case. There's no other court to go to to hear the case in the state. And so this is the appropriate place for these concerns to be raised, which is why I have raised them here today. And I hope that this body will not miss the opportunity to take affirmative action to address the concerns of so many millions of Americans, to say to millions of Americans tonight that violence is never warranted, that violence will not be tolerated, that those who engage in it will be prosecuted but that this body will act to address the concerns of all Americans across the country. We do need an investigation into irregularities, fraud. We do need a way forward together. We need election security reforms. I bet my friends on the other side of the aisle don't disagree with that. We need to find a way to move forward on that together so that the American people from both parties, all walks of life, can have confidence in their elections and that we can arrange ourselves under the rule of law that we share together. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Awesome. Democratic leader. Senator from Pennsylvania, Mr. Casey. Senator from Pennsylvania. I rise tonight to defend the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, to defend the more than 6.9 million voters who voted in this election, and to condemn in the strongest possible terms this attempt to disenfranchise the voters of Pennsylvania based upon a lie, a falsehood. That same lie sowed the seeds of today's violence and today's lawlessness here in the Capitol. One of my constituents, Susan from the Lehigh Valley, the community of our state where Senator Toomey lives, 
recently wrote to my office and perhaps said it best. She said, and I quote, we cannot allow anybody to overturn the legal votes of the citizens of Pennsylvania. This would be the ultimate destruction of our democracy, unquote. Susan had it right. We cannot allow anybody, and she put that word in all caps, to overturn the legal votes of the people of our state. Let me address the allegation regarding the Pennsylvania Constitution and the General Assembly. Somehow that the General Assembly didn't have the authority to enact no excuse mail-in voting that process for the people of our state. First, the law in question, Act 77, was passed in 2019 and was implemented without any serious question as to its constitutionality. The law was passed by a Republican-controlled General Assembly, House and Senate. It was only after the 2020 election when it became clear that President-elect Joe Biden won Pennsylvania by a little more than 80,000 votes did some Republican politicians in our state decide to challenge the constitutionality of the law. Second, Act 77 is plainly constitutional. My colleagues allege that the state constitution requires in-person voting except under limited circumstances. This is not true. While Pennsylvania lays out specific situations in which absentee voting is required, there is no in-person requirement in our state's constitution. The constitution set a floor, not a ceiling, for this type of voting. Second, apart from the argument made by my colleague, there's bipartisan agreement across our state at the local, state, and federal level that our election was fair, secure, and lawful. On Monday, my colleague from Pennsylvania Senator Toomey wrote in an op-ed, and I'm quoting, the evidence is overwhelming that Joe Biden won this election, unquote. There's simply no evidence to justify the outrageous claims of widespread voter fraud or election irregularities suggesting, suggested by those seeking to overturn the election. Sixty cases, court after court, all throughout our state and throughout the country, including the Supreme Court dealing with this bizarre argument that we know is based upon that lie. In one court, the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, Judge Bibas, appointed by President Trump, he said, quote, the campaign's claims have no merit, unquote. The United States, he said, has free and fair elections, which are the lifeblood of our democracy. Charges require specific allegations and then proof, we have neither here, unquote. So said Judge Bevis. Finally, Mr. President, a word about those election officials who did such work. These election officials all across our state, Republicans and Democrats, from red counties and blue counties, they did their jobs. They are patriots. And these objections are an attack on these Pennsylvania public servants. I'll give you one example. Republican Commissioner Al Smith, Al Schmidt, I should say, of Philadelphia. He wrote, and I said, and, and he wrote, as I, I will quote, as follows, quote, there really should not be a disagreement, regardless of party affiliation, when we're talking about counting votes by eligible voters. It's not a very controversial thing, or at least it shouldn't be, unquote. After Election Day, Commissioner Al Schmidt, his family and his colleagues, were subjected to death threats simply because he was trying to do his job with integrity. It calls to mind, Mr. President, that great line from America the Beautiful, a beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years. These election officials, like so many of our patriots, we heard from Senator Duckworth tonight, a real patriot. These patriots did their job. Let's support these patriots vote against this objection. Mr. I yield the Leader. I yield five minutes to the Senator from Utah, Senator Romney. Senator from Utah. Mr. President, today was heartbreaking, and, uh, and I was shaken to the core 
as I thought about the people I've met in China and Russia and Afghanistan and Iraq and other places who yearn for freedom and who look to this building and these shores as a place of hope. And I saw the images being broadcast around the world and it breaks my heart. I have 25 grandchildren. Many of them were watching TV, thinking about this building, whether their grandpa was okay. I knew I was okay. I must tell you as well, I was proud to serve with these men and women. This is an extraordinary group of people. I'm proud to be a member of the United States Senate and meet with people of integrity as we do here today. Now we gather due to a selfish man's injured pride and the outrage of supporters who he has deliberately misinformed for the past two months and stirred to action this very morning. What happened here today was an insurrection incited by the President of the United States. Those who choose to continue to support his dangerous gambit by objecting to the results of a legitimate democratic election will forever be seen as being complicit in an unprecedented attack against our democracy. Fairly or not, they'll be remembered for their role in this shameful episode in American history. That will be their legacy. I salute Senator Langford and Leffler and Braun and Danes, and I'm sure others, who in the light of today's outrage have withdrawn their objection. For any who remain insistent on an audit in order to satisfy the many people who believe that the election was stolen, I'd offer this perspective. No congressional audit is ever going to convince these voters, particularly when the president will continue to say that the election was stolen. The best way we can show respect for the voters who were upset is by telling them the truth. That's the burden. That's the duty of leadership. The truth is that President-elect Biden won the election. President Trump lost. I've had that experience myself. It's no fun. <laughs> Scores of courts, the president's own attorney general, state election officials, both Republican and Democrat, have reached that unequivocal decision. And in light of today's sad circumstances, I ask my colleague, do we weigh our own political fortunes more heavily than we weigh the strength of our republic, the strength of our democracy, and the cause of freedom? What's the weight of personal acclaim compared to the weight of conscience? Leader McConnell said that the vote today is the most important in his 36 years of public service. Think of that. Authorizing two wars, voting on two impeachments. He said that not because the vote reveals something about the election, it's because this vote reveals something about us. I urge my colleagues to move forward with completing the electoral count, to refrain from further objections, and to unanimously affirm the legitimacy of the presidential election. Thank you, Mr. President. Democratic leader. Senator from New Hampshire, Senator Shaheen. Senator from New Hampshire. Mr. President, on January 3rd, I, along with 31 of my colleagues, stood in this chamber and swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. It's both ironic and deeply disappointing that only three days after swearing these oaths, some of my colleagues are willfully coming close to breaking this promise. Since 1797, each U.S. president has peacefully handed over power to the next. And that will happen again on January 20th, when Donald Trump, despite the protesters today, the violence today, when Donald Trump leaves the White House at noon and Joe Biden becomes president. And we've heard tonight from both Democrats and Republicans about the importance of the voters speaking 
in the election, and about the fact that there is no evidence of widespread voter fraud. But this is not just an issue for us here in the United States. This is an issue for nascent democracies around the world who, as Senator Romney said, look to the United States as an example. We are the shining city on the hill. We give those struggling under oppression hope for a better future. Now, like so many of us in this chamber, I've traveled to developing democracies around the world, to Afghanistan and Iraq, to the Western Balkans, to Africa, to the country of Georgia. I went there with my colleague, Senator Risch. In 2012, we went to Georgia to observe officially, on behalf of the Senate, the election between outgoing President Mikhail Saakashvili and his United National Movement Party, and the challenge by Georgia, Georgian Dream, which was a newly formed party supported and funded by billionaire oligarch Bedzina Ivanishvili. It was a battle for parliament, but also for control of the government. Senator Risch and I visited multiple polling places on election day, and we agreed with the international assessment that that election was free and fair and that George and Dream were the winners. But there was real concern in the country that Saakashvili was going to refuse to give up power, that that would lead to violence, it would end the nascent democratic reforms that were happening in that former Soviet Republic. And so Senator Risch and I, the day after the election, went to visit President Saakashvili to try and talk him out of staying in power. And I remember very clearly going to his home. And we sat down with him and we pointed out that the hallmark of a democracy, what he had worked so hard for in his eight years as president of Georgia, the hallmark of that was to turn over power in a peaceful election to the person that the voters chose. Well, President Saakashvili listened to us, and he did leave office peacefully. But it's important that future generations recognize that America, like democracies everywhere, depends on a peaceful transition of power on believing in what the voters say and in ensuring that happens. Unfortunately, we've heard from some senators today who have been enabling President Trump's willful disregard of the votes of our citizenry, even as they speak out against foreign leaders who ignore their own people. They will fail and history will remember them. And I hope that future generations will view the actions of some of those folks today is little more than an unfortunate anomaly. Future opportunists may use this ill-fated effort to seek short-term political gain over the long-term stability of our republic. But for the sake of our great country and America's standing in the world, I ask my colleagues today to fully endorse the results of the free and fair election and set aside this partisan attempt to subvert the will of the people. We should be venerating the peaceful transition of power, even if our own preferred candidate didn't win. That is, after all, who we are in the United States of America. Thank you, Mr. President. Majority Leader. Mr. President, I yield uh, up to five minutes to the Senator from Ohio, Senator Portman. Senator from Ohio. Mr. Vice President, you have fulfilled your duties as President of the Senate tonight with distinction, and we all appreciate it. I,
I thought about changing my mind and not speaking tonight, given the lateness of the hour, and I know all of my colleagues would have appreciated that greatly, uh, but I felt it was necessary to speak because I want the American people, particularly my constituents in Ohio, to see that we will not be intimidated, that we will not be disrupted from our work, that here in the citadel of democracy, we will continue to do the work of the people. Mob rule is not going to prevail here. Now, let's face it, we did not reclaim this chamber tonight. Brave and selfless law enforcement officers stood in the breach and ensured that the citadel of democracy would be protected and that we would be defended. And we are deeply grateful for that, as is the nation. I've listened carefully to the comments of my colleagues, and I've listened over the past couple of weeks as this issue has been discussed. And I tell you, for me, it's not a hard decision. I stand with the Constitution. I stand with what the Constitution makes clear. The people and the states hold the power here, not us. My oath to the Constitution and my reverence for our democratic principles make it easy for me to confirm these state certifications. By the way, I posed this process some 15 years ago when some Democrats chose to object to the electors from my home state of Ohio after the 2004 elections. I opposed it then and I oppose it now. I said at the time, Congress must not thwart the will of the people. That's what we would be doing. Let's assume for a moment that those who object to the certifications are right, that the Constitution intended that a bare majority of members of Congress could circumvent the states that have chosen to certify the popular votes of their own state citizens. I ask the objectors to think about the precedent that would be set if we were to do that. What if the majority in the House and the Senate was of the other party when a presidential candidate of our party came through a close presidential election? Would you want a Congress controlled by the Democrats to play the role you now intend for us? It is asking Congress to substitute its judgment for the judgment of the voters and its judgment for the judgment of the states that certified the results. And even forgetting the dangerous precedent that would be set, what would be the basis for objecting in this election? Look, I voted for President Trump. I supported him because I believe the Trump administration's policies are better for Ohio and for the country. And I supported the Trump campaign's right to pursue recounts. They had every right to do it and legal challenges. I agree that there were instances of fraud and irregularities in the 2020 elections. I think we all do. And by the way, there is fraud and irregularities in every presidential election. But it is also true that after two months of recounts and legal challenges, not a single state recount changed the result. And of the dozens of lawsuits filed, not one found evidence of fraud or irregularities widespread enough to change the result of the election. This was the finding of numerous Republican appointed judges and the Trump administration's own Department of Justice. Every state has now weighed in and chosen to certify its electoral slate based on the popular vote as set out in the Constitution. I understand that many Americans who would never storm this Capitol don't trust the integrity of the 2020 election. Don't think the state should have certified. Don't think we should have accepted the results from the states and are insisting on more transparency and accountability. In the 2016 elections, lest we forget, many Democrats objected to the results and distrusted the election. I challenge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to listen, but also to do our part to try to restore faith in our elections. Mr. President, we should all work to improve the integrity of the electoral system. 
and the confidence of the American people in this bedrock of our great democratic republic. Today I'll do my constitutional duty and oppose these efforts to reject the state certified results. And tomorrow, in the wake of this attack on the Capitol, the pandemic that engulfs us and other national challenges, let's work together for the people. Yield back. Democratic leader. Uh, Mr. President, I believe we have eight minutes left, so I'd like to divide four to Senator King and four to Senator Van Holland. That's Senator correct, Holland. leader. Mr. President. Senator from Maine. Mr. President, Winston Churchill once said that he could do a two-hour speech extemporaneously, but a 10-minute speech took immense preparation. I don't know what he would have said about a four-minute speech. We are a 240-year anomaly in world history. We think that what we have here in this country is the way it's always been. It is a very unusual form of government. The normal form of government throughout world history is dictators, kings, czars, pharaohs, warlords, tyrants. And we thought 20 years ago the march of history was toward democracy, but it is in retreat in Hungary, in Turkey, goodness knows in Russia. Democracy as we have practiced it is fragile. It's fragile and it rests upon trust. It rests upon trust in facts. It rests upon trust in courts, in public officials, and yes, in elections. I don't sympathize or justify or in any way in any way support that's a mild that's putting it mildly what happened here today but I understand it I understand it because I saw those people interviewed today and they said we're here because this election has been stolen and the reason they said that is that their leader has been telling them that every day for two months. We cannot afford to pull bricks out from the foundation of trust that underlines, underlies our entire system. And I agree with Governor Romney that the answer to this problem is to tell people the truth, is to tell them what happened. It's easy to confront your opponents. It's hard to confront your friends. It's hard to tell your supporters something they don't want to hear. But that's our obligation. That's why the word leader is applied to people in jobs like ours. It's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be something that we take on as a sacred obligation. And if people believe something that isn't true, it's our obligation to tell them, no, I'm sorry it isn't. Just as Senator Portman just said, as Mike Lee just said, I'm sorry, we can't do this here. We don't want to do this here. This is a power reserved to the states, not to the Congress. And I agree with the majority leader. I think this is one of the most important votes any of us will ever take. On December 1st, 1862, Abraham Lincoln came to this building. He came to this building in the darkest days of the Civil War. He was trying to awaken the Congress to the crisis that we were facing. And he didn't feel that they were fully and effectively engaged. And he ended his speech that day with words that I think have an eerie relevance tonight. Here's what Abraham Lincoln said. Fellow Americans, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance 
can spare one or another of us. And here's his final words. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the mob violence and attack we saw on our Capitol today should be a wake-up call to each and every one of us of what happens when we fail to come together, not as Democrats and Republicans, but each of us as Americans to stand up to a president who time and again has shown contempt for our democracy, contempt for our Constitution. Today here on the Capitol, we witnessed people taking down an American flag and putting up a Trump flag. That is not democracy in the United States of America. As every senator who has spoken has mentioned, we have for hundreds of years had a peaceful transfer of power. Nobody likes to lose, and supporters of the losing candidate are always disappointed. What's different this time? We all know what's different this time. We had a president who, as a senator from New Jersey, said even before a vote was cast that if he didn't win the election, it was going to be a fraud. And every day since then has perpetrated that lie. We have a president who just today criticized very loyal vice president who is presiding right now, urging him to disregard his responsibilities under the Constitution of the United States in order to reinstall Donald Trump as president. The same person who got on the phone to the Secretary of State in Georgia and threatened him to change the results of the election. Mr. President, I read something this week I'd never thought I'd read in a newspaper in the United States of America. It was an op-ed by all the living former Secretaries of Defense, including Secretaries Rumsfeld, Cheney, and Mattis, warning warning the country about our tradition of peaceful transfer of power and that it would be inappropriate for the military to take sides. In the United States of America, we talk to the world about how we want to promote democracy and our values, and right here at home, too many are undermining those values. And Mr. President, Donald Trump could not do this alone. He can only do it if he's aided and abetted by individuals who are willing to perpetrate those lies and those conspiracies. And that is why it is so important that we as Democrats and Republicans and senators stand up together. Stand up together and tell the truth. You know, when you go into a court of law like those 60 cases, you're testifying under penalty of perjury. That's very different than here in the House and the Senate. And in all those 60 cases under penalty of perjury, there was no evidence of widespread fraud. So it should be easy for us all together to tell the truth. On January 20th, Joe Biden will be sworn in as the next president of the United States. He has said he wants to bring the country together. He has said he wants to bring Democrats and Republicans together to do some of the pressing business of this country, to defeat this pandemic, to get the economy going again, to face challenging issues of racial and social justice. I hope we will learn from what happened today, the mob attack on this Capitol, the price we pay when we don't stand up. 
for the truth and for democracy. James McHenry, Maryland's delegate to the Constitutional Convention, wrote about a famous exchange in his diaries between Elizabeth Willing Powell and Benjamin Franklin. Wrote, a lady asked Dr. Franklin, well, doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? A republic, replied Dr. Franklin, if you can keep it. My colleagues, this is a test of whether we're united to keep our republic. I hope we will pass the test together. Thank you, Mr. President. Majority Leader. Uh, Mr. President, I yield up to five minutes to the Senator from South Carolina, Senator Graham. Senator from South Carolina. Many times uh, my state has been the problem. I love it. It's where I want to die, but no time soon. Tim and I uh, have a, a good relationship. I, I love Tim Scott. 1876, South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida sent two slate of electors. They had two governments, by the way, and we didn't know what to do. Why did South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana do it? to hold the country hostage to end Reconstruction. It worked. The commission was eight to seven. It didn't work. Nobody accepted it. The way it ended is when Hayes did a deal with these three states. You give me the electors, I'll kick the Union Army out. The rest is history. It led to Jim Crow. If you're looking for historical guidance, this is not the one to pick. <laughs> if you're looking for a way to convince people there was no fraud, having a commission chosen by Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, and John Roberts is not going to get you to where you want to go. <laughs> it ain't going to work. So it's not going to do any good. It's going to delay and it gives credibility to a dark chapter of our history. That's why I'm not with you. But I will fight to my death for you. You're able to object. You're not doing anything wrong. Other people have objected. I just think it's a uniquely bad idea to delay this election. Uh, Trump and I, have, we've had a hell of a journey. I hate it then this way. Oh, my God, I hate it. From my point of view, he's been a consequential president. But today, first thing you'll see. All I can say is uh, count me out. Enough is enough. I've tried to be helpful. But when the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled four to three that they didn't violate the, Supreme, uh, the Constitution of Wisconsin, I agree with the three, but I accept the four. If Al Gore can accept five, four, he's not president. I can accept Wisconsin four to three. Pennsylvania, it went to the Second Circuit. So much for all the judges being in Trump's pocket. They said, no, you're wrong. I accept the Pennsylvania Second Circuit that Trump's lawsuit wasn't, wasn't right. Georgia, they said the Secretary of State took the law in his own hands. He changed the election laws unlawfully. A federal judge said, no, I accept the federal judge even though I don't agree with it. Fraud. They said there's 66,000 people in Georgia under 18 voted. How many people believe that? I asked, give me 10. I hadn't had one. They said 8,000 felons in prison in Arizona voted. Give me 10. I hadn't gotten one. Does that say there's, there's problems in every election? I don't buy this. Enough's enough. We got to end it. Vice President Pence, what they're asking you to do, you won't do because you can't. You talk about interesting times. I associate myself with Rand Paul. How many times will you hear that? <laughs> the mob has done something nobody else could do to get me and Rand to agree. Rand is right. If you're a conservative, this is the most offensive concept in the world that a single person could disenfranchise 155 million people. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and the House of Representatives, open all certificates and the vote shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes for president shall be president. Where in there does it say, Mike can say, I don't like the results. I want to send them back to the states. I believe there was fraud. 
to the conservatives who believe in the Constitution, now's your chance to stand up and be counted. Originalism, count me in. <laughs> it means what it says. So, Mike, Mr. Vice President, just hang in there. They, they said, we can count on Mike. All of us can count on the Vice President. You're going to do the right thing. You're going to do the constitutional thing. You got a son who flies F-35s. You got a son-in-law who flies F-18s. They're out there flying so that we can get it right here. There are people dying to my good friend from Illinois to make sure we have a chance to argue among ourselves. And when it's over, it is over. It is over. The final thing, Joe Biden. I've traveled the world with Joe. I hoped he lost. I prayed he would lose. He won. He's the legitimate president of the United States. I cannot convince people, certain groups, by my words, but I will tell you by my actions, that maybe I, among any, above all others in this body, need to say this. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are lawfully elected and will become the president and the vice president of the United States on January the 20th. Majority Leader. Mr. President, I yield back the balance of our time. All time has expired. The question is, shall the objections submitted by the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gozar, and the senator from Texas, Mr. Cruz, and others be sustained? Is there a second? There is. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. No. Mr. Barrasso. No. Mr. Bennett. No. Mrs. Blackburn. No. Mr. Blumenthal. No. Mr. Blunt. No. Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman. No. Mr. Braun. No. Mr. Brown. No. Mr. Burr. No. Ms. Cantwell. No. Mrs. Capito. No. Mr. Carden. No. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey, no. Mr. Cassidy, no. Ms. Collins, no. Mr. Coons, no. Mr. Cornyn, no. Ms. Cortez Masto, no. Mr. Cotton, no. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, no. Mr. Cruz, Aye. Mr. Danes, no. Ms. Duckworth, no. Mr. Durbin, no. Ms. Ernst, no. Mrs. Feinstein, no. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibrand, no. Mr. Graham, no. Mr. Grassley, no. Mr. Haggerty, no. Ms. Harris, no. Ms. Hassan, no. Mr. Holy, no. Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Hickenlooper, no. Ms. Hirono, no. no, Mr. Hoven, no. Mrs. Hyde-Smith, 
Mr. Inhofe. Mr. Johnson. No. Mr. Kane. No. Mr. Kelly. No. Mr. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. King. No. Ms. Klobuchar. No. Mr. Lankford. Mr. Leahy. No. Mr. Lee. No. Mrs. Leffler. No. Mr. Lujan. No. Ms. Lummis. No. Mr. Manchin. No. Mr. Markey. Mr. Marshall. Aye. Mr. McConnell. No. Mr. Menendez. No. Mr. Merkley. No. Mr. Moran. No. Ms. Murkowski. No. Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Murray. No. Mr. Paul. No. Mr. Peters. No. Mr. Portman. No. Mr. Reed. No. Mr. Risch. No. Mr. Romney. No. Ms. Rosen. Mr. Rounds. No. Mr. Rubio. No. Mr. Sanders. No. Mr. Sass. No. Mr. Schatz. No. Mr. Schumer. No. Mr. Scott of Florida. No. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Mrs. Shaheen. Mr. Shelby. Ms. Cinema. Ms. Smith. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Tillis. No. Mr. Toomey. No. Mr. Tuberville. Aye. Mr. Van Hollen. No. Mr. Warner. No. Ms. Warren. No. Mr. Whitehouse. No. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. No. Mr. Young. No.
On this vote, the yeas are six, the nays are 93. The objection is not sustained. The Secretary will notify the House of the action of the Senate, informing that body that the Senate is now ready to proceed to joint session with further counting of the electoral vote for President and Vice President. Majority Leader. Mr. President. So, colleagues, here's where we are. Uh, we have a few more speakers now as we wait for the House to finish their debate and vote. We expect the House to finish voting on Arizona between 1130 and midnight. I ask unanimous consent the Senate be in a period of morning business with the following senators permitted to speak therein for up to five minutes each. Senator Toomey, Senator Rubio, Senator Collins. And on our side, Senators Wyden, Hirono, and Coons. Finally, following their remarks, the Senate stand in recess subject to the call of the chair. No, no, no. Maybe not. We may have more. Okay, so we'll figure it out. The Senate would be in a period of morning business with the following senators permitted to speak therein for up to five minutes each. Toomey, Rubio, Collins. Wyden, Hirono, and Coons. Without objection. Many will. Is this, this isn't yours, right? Got it. So we're in recent. Is that? It's a hell of a job. Are you speaking again? Well, I... Mr. President. The Senator from Pennsylvania. The Senate will be in order. Senate will be in order. Senate will be in order. Please take your conversations out of the chamber. Senator from Pennsylvania. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I uh, appreciate the indulgence of my colleagues allowing me to speak twice today, but um, my understanding is that later this evening, uh, objectors will object to the certification of Pennsylvania's electoral votes because they disapprove of the process that my state used in the last election. Senator, will the senators suspend for a minute? Please take your conversations out of the chamber. The senator deserves to be heard. Senators recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. President. So uh, in, in light of my expectation of this ob objection, I'm, I rise to defend the right of my, my citizens, my constituents, to vote in the presidential election. And let's be clear, that's exactly what this objection is about. It's what it would do. It would overturn the results of the presidential election of Pennsylvania, and it would thereby deny Pennsylvania's voters the opportunity to even participate in the presidential election. Mr. President, even if Congress did have the constitutional responsibility to judge the worthiness of a state's election process, which it does not, rejecting Pennsylvania's electoral votes would still be wildly out of proportion to the purported offenses and very damaging to our republic. Let me go through a few facts about Pennsylvania. First, some of the objectors, and in fact, even the President of the United States this morning, have observed that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court disregarded existing law when it ruled that mail-in ballots could be counted even if they arrived up to three days after the election day. Just an insurmountable amount of grief with his family, and I want all of our fellow Americans watching to know that we did that because we care about each other, and we don't want bad things to happen to each other, and our heart hurts when they do. Now, I'm sure there are plenty of folks over there who don't like me too much, and there are a few of you that I don't care for too much, but if anybody had been hurt today, it would have been even more of a catastrophe than we already saw, and I think that's an important point for the country. Another important point for the country is that this morning, President Trump explicitly called for demonstrations and protests to be peaceful. He was far more, you can moan and groan, but he was far more explicit about his calls for peace than some of the BLM and left-wing rioters were this summer when we saw violence sweep across this nation. Now, we came here today to debate, to follow regular order, to offer an objection, to follow a process that is expressly contemplated in our Constitution. And for doing that, we got called a bunch of seditious traitors. Now, not since 1985 has a Republican president been sworn in, absent some Democrat effort, to object to the electors. But when we do it, it is the new violation of all norms. And when those things are said, people get angry. Now, I know there are many countries where political violence may be necessary, but America is not one such country. Madam Speaker, it was wrong when people vandalized and defaced your home. It was wrong when thugs went to Senator Hawley's home. And I don't know if the reports are true, but the Washington Times has just reported some pretty compelling evidence from a facial recognition company showing that some of the people who breached the Capitol today were not Trump supporters. They were masquerading as Trump supporters and, in fact, were members of the violent terrorist group Antifa. Now, we should seek to build America up not tear her down and destroy her. And I am sure glad that at least for one day, I didn't hear my Democrat colleagues calling to defund the police. Now, I appreciate all the talk. Now, I appreciate all the talk of coming together, but let us not pretend that our colleagues on the left have been free of some anti-democratic impulses just because we signed on to legal briefs and asked courts to resolve disputes. There were some on the left who said that we should not even be seated in the body, that we ought to be prosecuted, maybe even jailed. Those arguments anger people, but people do understand the concepts of basic fairness. And no competition, contest, or election can be deemed fair if the participants are subject to different rules. Baseball teams that cheat and steal signs should be stripped of their championships. Russian Olympians who cheat and use steroids should be stripped of their medals, and states that do not run clean elections should be stripped of their electors. This fraud was systemic. It was repeated. It was the same system, and I dare say it was effective. We saw circumstances where when Democrat operatives couldn't get the outcomes they wanted in state legislators, 
When they couldn't get the job done there, they went and pressured and litigated and usurped the Constitution with extra constitutional action of some officials in some states. They fraudulently la laundered ballots, votes, voter registration forms, and then they limited review. In 2016, Democrats found out that they couldn't beat Donald Trump at the ballot box with voters who actually show up, so they turned to impeachment and the witness box. And when that failed, they ran to the mailbox, where this election saw an unprecedented amount of votes that could not be authenticated with true ID, with true signature match, and with true confidence for the American people. Our Article III courts have failed by not holding evidentiary hearings to weigh the evidence. We should not join in that fa failure. We should vindicate the rights of states. We should vindicate the subpoenas in Arizona that have been issued to get a hold of these voting machines, and we should reject these electors. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Colorado seek recognition? in opposition to the objection. The objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield my time to the Dean of the Arizona Delegation, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you. recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the gentle lady from Colorado for yielding time. I'll be very brief, Madam Speaker. There's really nothing left to say. This ch challenge brought by uh, members of uh, this House Republican members from this house from Arizona and a senator from Texas. Uh, the whole discussion today, this challenge to the electoral, 11 electoral votes that are designated for President Biden and Vice President Harris, the discussion today proved there is no merit to denying those electoral votes. There's no legal standing. The courts have proven that in Arizona time and time again. There is no precedent. There is no constitutional violation. But we're here today, Madam Speaker, because of, the, uh, because of one man and those who uh, are desperate to please him. So what do we have to show for this process today? Fear a lockdown, violence, and regrettably and sadly, death, arrests, present and real danger, threats, and assault on our institution, this House, this Congress, and the very democracy that we practice here. And to what end? What did we accomplish? The reality is that the challenge will be defeated come January 20th. President Biden and President Harris will be the President and Vice President of the United States. So what have we accomplished? To further divide this nation, to continue to fan the same rhetoric of division and us versus them, to paralyze and dismantle our democracy? Is that what we're attempting to accomplish today? The mob that attacked this institution, I hold no member specifically responsible in, for that madness that was around us. But we do share a responsibility, my friends, to end it. It's past time to accept reality, to reaffirm our democracy, and move on. Help out, I would urge my colleagues from Arizona who filed this challenge to withdraw their challenge to this, to Arizona and to the electors that have been chosen to, to, to give their 11 votes to the winners in that election. But if that doesn't happen, then I would urge my colleagues to reject this challenge and uh, defend all voters, defend the voters of Arizona, and that democracy that we
practice daily in the representation of our constituents. That's what's at stake today. And with that, I yield back to the general lady from Colorado and, and thank her for the time. I thank the gentleman. Madam Speaker, on Sunday, every member in this chamber took an oath to uphold the Constitution. And there's only one vote tonight for those who took that oath. And that vote is to reject this challenge. I yield back. Thank you. All the time for debate has expired. The question is, shall the objection to the Arizona Electoral College vote count submitted by the gentleman uh, from Arizona, Mr. Gozar, and the senator from Texas, Mr. Cruz, be agreed to. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have okay. it. Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman uh, from Ohio seek recognition? We would ask for a roll call. The yeas and nays have been requested pursuant to section 3S of House Resolution 8. The yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device and are to reminded to vote when their group is called.
vote. The yeas are 121. The nays are 303. The noes have it. The objection is not agreed to. And without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The clerk will now notify the Senate of the action of this House, informing that body that the House is now ready to proceed in joint session with the further counting of the electoral vote for the President and the Vice President. To remind both sides of the aisle, during the joint session, there are 11 House Republicans, 11 House Democrats, 11 House Senate Democrats, 11 Senate Republicans, 44 members on the floor. Please view the proceedings from your offices. Thank you. It's not a suggestion, that is a direction in the interest of good example to the public of how serious we take the coronavirus threat and the need for social distancing. Please, my colleagues, if you are not having a participating in the next part of this, please return to your offices.
Chair will receive a message. Madam Speaker, a message from the Senate. Madam Speaker. Madam Secretary. I have been directed by the Secretary of the Senate to inform the House that the Senate is ready to proceed in joint session with the House of Representatives.
Madam Speaker, the Vice President and the United States Senate. The joint session of Congress to count the electoral vote will resume.
The tellers having taken their seats, the two houses retired to consider separately and decide upon the vote of the state of Arizona to which an objection has been filed. The Secretary of the Senate will report the action of the Senate. In the Senate of the United States, ordered that the Senate, by a vote of six ayes to 93 nays, rejects the objection to the electoral votes cast in the state of Arizona for Joseph R. Biden for president and Kamala D. Harris for vice president. The Clerk of the House will report the action of the House. Order that the House of Representatives rejects the objections to the electoral vote of the state of Arizona. Pursuant to the law, Chapter 1 of Title III of the United States Code, because the two houses have not sustained the objection, the original certificate submitted by the state of Arizona will be counted as provided therein. The tellers will now record and announce the vote of the state of Arkansas for president and vice president in accordance with the action of the two houses. This certificate from Arkansas, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, and that is annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Arkansas seems to be in regular in, seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received six votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received six votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Arkansas that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. Hearing none. This certificate from California, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be returned from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of California, I would say the great state of California, seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr., the state of Delaware, received 55 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris, of the state of California, received 55 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of California that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. This certificate from Colorado, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Colorado seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received nine votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received nine votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote to the state of Colorado that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. This certificate from Connecticut, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Connecticut seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received seven votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received seven votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Connecticut that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. Hearing none. 
This certificate from Delaware, the parliamentarians advised me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Delaware seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received three votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received three votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Delaware that the tellers verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. This certificate from the District of Columbia, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the district that purports to be a return from the district and has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the district purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the District of Columbia seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received three votes for president and Kamala D. Harris from the state of California received three votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the District of Columbia that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. This certificate from Florida, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Florida seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received 29 votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received 29 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Florida that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Georgia, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Georgia seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received 16 votes for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 16 votes for vice president. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Mr. President, myself, members of the Georgia delegation and some 74 of my Republican colleagues and I object to the electoral votes from the state of Georgia on the grounds that the election conducted on November 3rd was faulty and fraudulent due to un uh, due to unilateral actions by the Secretary of State to unlawfully change the state's election process without approval from the General Assembly and thereby setting the stage for an unprecedented amount of fraud and irregularities. And I have signed the objection myself. Uh, sections 15 and 17 of Title III of the United States Code require that any objection be presented in writing and signed by a member of the House of Representatives and a senator. Is the objection in writing and signed by a member and a senator? Mr. President, prior to the actions and events of today, we did, but following the events of today, it appears that some senators have withdrawn their objection. In that case, the objection cannot be entertained. Section 18 of Title III of the United States Code moves us. This certificate from Hawaii, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. 
Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Hawaii seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received four votes for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received four votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote from the state of Hawaii that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Idaho, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Idaho seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received four votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received four votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote from the state of Idaho that the teller has verified appear to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. Hearing none. This certificate from Illinois, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be returned from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Illinois seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received 20 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 20 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Illinois that the teller has verified appears to be in regular form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Indiana, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be returned from the state and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Indiana seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received 11 votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received 11 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Indiana that the teller has verified? Appears to be regular in form and authentic. Hearing none. This certificate from Iowa, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Iowa seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received six votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received six votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Iowa that the teller has verified? It appears to be regular and authentic. Hearing none, this certificate from Kansas, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be returned from the state and that has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Kansas seems to be regular in form and authentic. It appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received six votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received six votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Kansas that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from the Commonwealth of Kentucky, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the Commonwealth of Kentucky seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received eight votes for president, 
and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received eight votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the Commonwealth of Kentucky? That the teller is verified appears to be regular in form and authentic. Hearing none, this certificate from Louisiana, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state. It purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority from the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Louisiana seems to be regular in form and authentic and appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received eight votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received eight votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Louisiana? That the tellers verified to be regular in form and authentic. Hearing none, this certificate from Maine, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state that has annexed to it a certificate of authority from the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Maine seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received three votes for president, and Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received one vote for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received three votes for vice president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received one vote for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Maine that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Maryland, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state, purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Maryland seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received 10 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 10 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Maryland that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. This certificate from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from that state, purports to be a return from the state, and has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received 11 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 11 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? The tellers advised appear to be regular in form and authentic. Hearing none, this certificate from Michigan, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote in that state that purports to be a return from the state and has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Michigan seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received 16 votes for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 16 votes for vice president. For what reason does the gentlelady from Georgia rise? Mr. President, I, along with 70 of my Republican colleagues, object to the counting of the electoral votes for the state of Michigan on the grounds that the error rate precedes the FEC rate allowed at 0.0008% and that the people who signed affidavits at risk of perjury their voices have not been heard in a court of law. Uh, Section 15 and 17 of Title III of the U.S. Code require that any objection be presented in writing and signed by a member of the House of Representatives and a senator. Is the objection in writing and signed by a member and a senator? 
The objection is writing, not signed by a senator. In that case, the objection cannot be entertained. Are there any further objections to counting the certificate of the vote from the state of Michigan? The certificate that Taylor has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic. Hearing no further objections, this certificate from Minnesota, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state, annexed to its certificate of authority from the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Minnesota seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received 10 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 10 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Minnesota that the tellers verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Mississippi, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from that state. It purports to be a return from the state as annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Mississippi seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received six votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received six votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote from the state of Mississippi that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Missouri, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Missouri seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received 10 votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received 10 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Missouri that the tellers verified appears to be regular and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Montana, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state and that has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Montana seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received three votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received three votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Montana that the teller verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. This certificate from Nebraska, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state that has annexed to it a certificate of authority from the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Nebraska seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received four votes for president and Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received one vote for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received four votes for vice president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received one vote for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote from the state of Nebraska that the tellers verified as regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. This certificate from Nevada, the parliamentarian advises, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate of authority from the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Nevada seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. 
of the state of Delaware received six votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received six votes for vice president. For what reason does the gentleman from Alabama rise? Mr. President, I and 55 other members of the United States House of Representatives object to the electoral votes of the state of Nevada in order to protect the lawful votes of Nevada and all other American citizens. Section 15 and 17 of Title III of the United States Code requires that any objection be presented in writing and signed by a member of the House of Representatives and a senator. Is the objection in writing and signed by a member and a senator? Mr. President, it is in writing, but unfortunately, no United States senator has joined in this effort. In that case, the objection cannot be entertained. Are there any further objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Nevada that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? This certificate from New Hampshire, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of New Hampshire seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received four votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received four votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of New Hampshire that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? This certificate from New Jersey, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority in the state, purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of New Jersey seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received 14 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 14 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of New Jersey? The tellers verified appears to be regular in form and authentic. This certificate from New Mexico, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state and that has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of New Mexico seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received five votes for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received five votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the state of New Mexico that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from New York, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be returned from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority from the state, purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of New York seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received 29 votes for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 29 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of New York that the tellers verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from North Carolina, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate from the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of North Carolina seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received 15 votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received 15 votes 
for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of North Carolina? That the teller is verified appears to be regular in form and authentic. This certificate from North Dakota, the parliamentarians advise me is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state that has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of North Dakota seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received three votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received three votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote for the state of North Dakota that the teller is verified as regular and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Ohio, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Ohio seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received 18 votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received 18 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote from the state of Ohio that the teller has verified as regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Oklahoma, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from that state, purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Oklahoma seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received seven votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received seven votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Oklahoma that the teller has verified to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Oregon, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be returned from the state, has a certificate of authority from the state annexed to it to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Oregon seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received seven votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received seven votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Oregon that the teller has verified as regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return of the state, has annexed to it a certificate from an authority in the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received 20 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 20 votes for vice president. For what reason does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Mr. President, sadly but resolutely, I object to the electoral votes of my beloved Commonwealth of Pennsylvania on the grounds of multiple constitutional infractions that they were not, under all of the known circumstances, regularly given. And on this occasion, I have a written objection signed by a senator and 80 members of the House of Representatives. Yeah. Is the objection in writing and signed by a senator? Yes, Mr. President, it is. An objection presented in writing and signed by both a representative and a senator complies with the law. Chapter 1, Title 3 of the United States Code. The clerk will report the objection. We, a United States Senator and members of the House of Representatives, object to the counting of the electoral votes of the state of Pennsylvania on the ground 
that they were not, under all of the known circumstances, regularly given. Signed, Josh Harley, United States Senator, Scott Perry, Member of Congress. Are there further objections to the certificates from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? The chair hears none. The two houses will withdraw from joint session. Each house will deliberate separately on the pending objection and report its decision back to the joint session. The Senate will now retire to its chamber.
The House will be in order pursuant to Senate Concurrent Resolution 1. The House will be in order. Thank you. Pursuant to Second Senate Concurrent Resolution 1 and Section 17 of Title III, United States Code, when the two houses withdraw from the joint Senate session to count the electoral vote for separate consideration of an objection, a representative may speak to the objection for five minutes and not more than once. Debate shall not exceed two hours, after which the chair shall put the question, shall the objection be agreed to? The clerk will report the objection made in joint session. We, a United States Senator and members of the House of Representatives, object to the counting of the electoral votes of the state of Pennsylvania on the ground that they were not, under all of the known circumstances, regularly given. Signed, Josh Howley and Scott Perry. The chair will endeavor to alternate recognition between members speaking in support of the objection and members speaking in opposition to the objection. Uh, before I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, the House will be in order. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is a somber day for the defense of the Constitution. See, the Constitution is just a piece of paper. It cannot defend itself. That is why our leaders swear an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, and that's what I'm doing here this evening. The Constitution states the times, place, and manner of holding elections shall be prescribed by the legislature, not the courts, not the governor, not the secretary of state or other bureaucrats or elected officials, the legislature. In Pennsylvania, the Supreme Court unilaterally extended the deadline for ballots to three days after the election. They actually wanted 10. The Supreme Court is not the legislature. The Supreme Court mandated unpostmarked ballots to be received destroying the validity of all the votes that were cast timely. The Supreme Court action defied the law, the legislature, and the will of the people. The Supreme Court authorized the use of drop boxes where ballot harvesting could occur. The legislature never authorized that form of voting, and the court had absolutely no right to do so. Responding to the Secretary of State, Kathy Bookvar, the Supreme Court ruled that mail-in ballots need not authenticate signatures. Once again, the court not only defied the Constitution and the will of the people, but by so doing, they created a separate class of voters, thereby violating the Equal Protections Clause prescribed in the 